do and intermittent fasting can be really safe in fact we're seeing a lot of data that's why doctors are loving it that that it really works not just for weight loss for actually reducing our risk of disease so it's very safe and we're really recommending it to a lot of people the few people who need to pay attention if you're diabetic and you're monitoring your blood sugar with either um a, a blood sugar monitor like when you're checking your blood on your finger or you have one of those continuous glucose monitors Monitors. You want to make sure you talk to your doctor about that. This may be something you need to adjust. Or perhaps you're on medication and that medication needs to be taken with food, then you need to pay attention to the timing there or chat with your doctor about that. Outside of that, intermittent fasting, super safe, really easy to follow, and it works. That's why it's the number one fad diet in America. Is it really number one? Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Number one fad diet in America. Gotcha. Um, let's get yeah. into specifics about um, the best candidates for intermittent fasting. Uh, is there a certain body type? What about, what about age groups? Um, you know, kids are growing, so we certainly don't want to restrict them. Usually kids are eating more um, for natural hunger as opposed to sometimes we just want to eat because we're we're feeling munchy or something like that. So probably you want to wait until they're older teenagers or adults before they start fasting. But kids will actually naturally fast. They just don't eat when they're not hungry, right? So that's okay age-wise. As we get older, really, there's no age limit where you would not want to intermittent fast. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, really, every body type is is great. And one of the best things about intermittent fasting, it's not like the keto diet. Keto is okay, and you're going to get results from that, but it's really short-lived. It's hard to live in the keto world for a really long time. But once you start to get used to intermittent fasting, this can be something that you can do for life. So it's really a great thing for, for anybody who's trying to either maintain their weight or really try to lose weight. If you're going to lose weight, you may want to avoid some of those um those fun foods that we were talking about at least in the beginning until you get to your your maintenance weight but really that's what's so great about intermittent fasting is it really can be for anyone yeah it is uh and it's something that that i've enjoyed uh, i do it um, usually at work and, and i don't generally do it yeah. on the weekends um but uh, I, you know questions um around intermittent fasting because then um some people ask well are what about someone who doesn't eat all day or, or goes several days and all they have is you know water or coffee or something like that? Is that safe? I, I always hear that when you do intermittent fasting or when you fast for, let's say, a day or so, it really helps your cells. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, there's actually studies that show really the magic happens when you're looking at reducing inflammation or regeneration of damaged cells happens when you get into the 18 to 21 hour fast window and beyond that. So, you know, for weight loss purposes, it's really great to start and simple to start with something like an 8-16 an or a 16-8 fast. Um, but when you're really trying to correct um, some dysfunction there or reduce inflammation, you want to get into those longer fasts. And there are some studies where doing a longer, you know, 24 hour, 36 hour fast can really be beneficial, especially like for cancer. We're kind of starving the cancer if you want to think about it that way. Um, so there's some studies that really look around that. Of course, you want to make sure that you're hydrated. And again, if you're if you're struggling with low blood sugar or things like that, then you, you just want to pay attention to that. Sometimes there are some foods that are allowed in the fasting. So some of those fasting days, there's some articles that talk about um, you can eat up to 500 calories and that still would be considered a fast. There are other people who do what they call one meal a day. And basically they're fasting throughout the day and they just have one meal. So it's not even a window of, you know, time six hours, it's just one meal a day. Again, the term intermittent fasting is important. So if you go to one meal a day, that's okay, but you may want to adjust that throughout your week in terms of what time that meal is, because if you do that every day for the rest of your life, your body's going to adapt to that. And then it's not really intermittent anymore. So, you know, once you get into it, you may want to start adjusting that time frame a little bit. What does it do for your metabolism? Does it speed it up? Does it slow it down? Do we know? 
Um, you know, that's an, you know, there's kind of this idea that people who are gaining weight or can't lose weight have a slow metabolism. And then people who can, you know, it seems like they just have um, an unlimited amount of food that they can eat, but they're still skinny, have a fast metabolism. I don't know that that's really weir real. I mean, there's so many different variables that go into that. So um, intermittent fasting, I would say probably whether you want to call it metabolism, but when you're fasting, it actually speeds up your body's ability to get stored fat. So you're not starving yourself. If you go into starvation mode over a long period of time, your body starts looking for energy in the form of your muscle. So it's going to use up muscle where the ability with intermittent fasting is actually gathering your fat cells. So your metabolism improves in the fact that it's it's helping you to burn fat instead of burn calories from muscle or your food, basically. So it's really going to help you lose more fat. All right. So if our viewers are interested, we've been talking about this for a few minutes. They're interested. They're like, OK, let me try this out. What, what would be your recommendation if someone wanted to try out intermittent fasting, Amy? Yeah, that clock way is the easiest way is just pick a window, you know, between six and eight hours that you're going to eat. And then the window between 16 to 18 hours that you're fasting. The easiest way, just like I described, is to start at noon and at six or 7 p.m. That way you're sleeping through a good, you know, for getting the eight hours of sleep we're supposed to. You're sleeping during most of your fasting. A lot of people aren't starving first thing in the morning. You can have tea. You can have black coffee. Um, you just don't want to consume a lot of calories, make sure, you're, again, you're still real hydrated, and then you just start eating again at lunchtime the next day. That is the easiest way to get started. Awesome. Uh, Amy Duffy, we really appreciate uh, your analysis, your insight on this, and uh, thanks so very much. Happy New Year to you. We live in some stressful times, certainly, and uh, a lot of times that stress can be very toxic with the youngest generation that's out there. Let's bring in uh, a pediatrician to help us kind of manage through the best practices to help our kids when it comes to stress. I'm joined now by Nadine Burke uh, Harris. She is a pediatrician, and she's going to help us navigate the best, best methods out there to help our kids during stressful times. Uh, Dr. Harris, uh, thank you for joining us on the digital desk. Where do we start when it comes to this conversation about how to help kids manage stress? Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's important for under, us to understand that stress can really affect children's health. And when that stress is severe or pervasive, as with adverse childhood experiences, things like abuse or neglect or, or growing up in a household where a parent is substance dependent or experiencing a mental health condition, that this stress can actually get under our skin, change our biology, and it can lead to something called the toxic stress response. That is when our stress response becomes overactive and it gets prolonged, and it can actually lead to things like increased risk of asthma or diabetes or depression, or in the long run, it can lead to things like heart disease or cancer in adulthood. Yeah, I totally could see how um, that could uh, develop in a, in a very negative and adverse way. Um, so where do we begin to give them 
upbeat and positive affirmations? Yes. Well, what we know and what the science shows is that safe, stable and nurturing relationships and environments are actually healing for kids biologically. They can actually interrupt the stress response and help children's brains and bodies heal from the impacts of toxic stress. I feel like we need like some bullet points to help people, um, you know, when it comes to ways to manage stress in their kids' lives. What else can we talk about? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things. And I, and I want to share why this is so important. In December, the CDC just came out with a report that shows that in Tennessee alone, adverse childhood experiences cost $354 billion a year in healthcare costs and lost productivity. And so when we are talking about implementing these solutions, there are things that we can do at home, things like you know, regular exercise, mindfulness, nutrition, mental health if necessary, things like spending time in nature. But we also recognize that the solution has to be systemic. We have to do early detection and early intervention for young people so that they can get the interventions that help to regulate the stress response and prevent those health problems in the long run. I love it. Uh, it's, it's a great idea and, and certainly a, a great plan out there. There are a lot of old school folks out there that you probably run across, uh, Dr. Harrison. They said, well, you know, this will, this will toughen them up in real life. Um, how do we give our kids resiliency without, uh, you know, toughing them, toughen them up, you know, with these negative um, toxic stress uh, moments that they may have as a, as a youngster? I think that so many of us subscribe to this idea that, you know, we got to pull ourselves up our, by our bootstraps and it'll toughen our kids up. But it turns out that research from the CDC shows that when kids are exposed to these high levels of uh, stress, like having uh, parental mental illness or substance dependence or violence in the home, that it really increases their risk for long-term health problems uh, like I said, like, like heart disease and cancer. And so it is by providing those safe and stable relationships. It's by providing that early intervention to mental health that kids uh, develop that resilience. That's where the resilience comes from, is from these nurturing interventions to help kids be able to feel safe. What else, uh, Dr. Harris, what else can we touch on? Well, uh, one of the things that we really have to understand is uh, that two-thirds of Americans have experienced adverse childhood experiences. And so the more that our community and our population can learn about this issue, how we can prevent these things from being handed down from one generation to the next, right? Because that's what we see a lot of the times is that, you know, the, the challenges, the struggles that that we experience in our own childhood, if we don't intervene, if we don't do things differently, the chances are that we could hand those things down to our kids, right? And then that can put them at risk. So learning more, uh, numberstory.org is a wonderful resource for your viewers to learn more about adverse childhood experiences and what they can do. Or uh, The Deepest Well is my book that helps folks understand how this can impact them and what we can do to prevent it. All right, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, a pediatrician, helping uh, us with our children's stress. We appreciate the uh, advice. Thanks so very much.
But right now I want to talk about how we, as humans, as people, as men and women, how do we look and feel younger? Don't we always want to try and look and feel younger? Of course we do. Well, there is a brand new book I'm holding up right now. It's Younger for Life, and it's written by someone that is very big in today's world, whether it's online, whether it's uh, in uh, his profession, or whether you perhaps have seen him on TV or a podcast. I'm talking about Dr. Anthony Yoon joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. He is a holistic plastic surgeon. He has some 15 million followers. And Dr. Yoon, I really appreciate you joining us on the Digital Desk. I heard you on a podcast last week with Dave uh, Aspen and uh, And uh, I heard you talking about this book, and my wife was so excited to hear that I was talking with you. Uh, First, can you just talk about what a holistic plastic surgeon is? Because I know that there's some viewers out there that have no idea what that means. Good morning to you. Good morning. So, yeah, I am a traditionally trained plastic surgeon. I went through four years of medical school. I did residency and surgery as well as plastic surgery. And I realized as I had gotten into practice for many years that what I was doing was wrong. And the goal of being a surgeon has always been to bring people to surgery. But I realized that my goal should be the opposite. It should be how do I keep people out of the operating room, yet help them to look and feel their best. So as a holistic plastic surgeon, I use plastic surgery as a last resort. That sounds fantastic. And, and then looking at your book, um, Tony, uh, do you mind if I call you Tony? Um, no, it's totally looking, fine. Perfect. And, and so this book is Younger for Life, and it's Feel Great, Look Your Best with New Science. And it's, it's a new term that I'm learning about um, when I flip the pages, auto-juvenation. What exactly is that? So autojuvenation is the fact that your body contains immense regenerative abilities to turn back the clock naturally, but you have to unlock it by giving it the right tools and the right environment for it to do so. And so it focuses on five main things that you can make simple changes to these five main things can make huge changes in your skin and your overall, overall aging. And that is what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare products, and non-invasive treatment. So by focusing on these five things, I think the vast majority of people can turn back the clock naturally and not feel the need to have to go under the knife. Tony, what about the very first thing you should do if you are in your perhaps 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, and you want to start today, or 2024 is going to be the year that you try to look and feel younger, where do you begin? The first place to begin is always what you eat. That's the the hallmark, the number one thing you wanna focus on because what you eat is going to truly impact your skin in major ways. And so eating healthy sources of protein uh, like pastured pork and chicken, grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish, our skin is composed 70 to 80% of collagen and that collagen is protein. And so you need to fuel your body with healthy sources of protein in order to keep that collagen up. Uh, Second thing I encourage people to do is eat the rainbow of colorful fruits and vegetables. These contain antioxidants, which fight the aging aging process. And on the opposite side, you want to decrease the amount of ultra-processed foods that you eat. These are foods that don't look anything like their original, uh, what their original uh, food was, uh, plant was made out of. And so a Twinkie is ultra-processed because it doesn't look anything like the plant that it originated from. And then the final thing is to reduce the amount of sugar that you eat. 20% 20% of, our, of the calories of the standard American diet come from sugar-sweetened drinks. And so reducing soda pop, uh, uh, energy-type drinks, and even fruit juices can be very beneficial to your health and to your skin as well. Is there an optimal age that we can um, start looking younger? Is there a certain age that we say, okay, here's where you need to start because if you start beyond this, then we run into some issues? Well, it's actually never too late to start. And that's the great thing is we have had people who have done the Younger for Life diet. They have done the 21 day jumpstart from the Younger for Life book and in their even in their 70s. And it found significant changes in the quality and the health of their skin and looking actually five to 10 years younger. So, you know, do you need to look younger when you're in your 20s? Well, when we're in our 20s, our skin tends to look great anyway. But anytime after that, you can really see significant changes by making these small changes in those five main things. 
How do we jumpstart the rejuvenation process? Well, one very simple way you can jumpstart it, in addition to changing the diet, is to get on a very simple but effective skincare routine. Uh, and so I have something in the book called the Two Minutes Five Years Younger Skin Carotene. It takes just two minutes a day. You start by cleansing your skin in the morning. Then you apply an antioxidant serum like vitamin C and then a sunscreen at least SPF 30. At night, you want to start by cleansing your skin to get rid of the day's worth of grime and makeup and, and dirt and oil and pollution. And then you want to apply a retinol. Retinol is a derivative of vitamin A, scientifically proven to help fight that aging process and to actually thicken the collagen of your skin. Finally, you want to exfoliate your skin once or twice a week, utilizing a gentle scrub or an alpha hydroxy acid type of peel. Uh, that's a great way to kind of jumpstart that process. You make those changes to your food. Ideally, you even take a collagen supplement every day, and that can also impact the collagen of your skin and help it look and feel younger. Where do people make the most mistakes? You know, if they come up with the same attitude, a great attitude that says, okay, I want to look younger now. I want to feel great, look great. Where do they go wrong, Tony? Well, we see it kind of in some ways falls on uh, gender lines. So men, where they tend to go wrong is they just don't do anything. They wash their face with bar soap. They don't use sunscreen and they don't do anything preventative until quite a bit later in the game. Uh, with women, it's almost the opposite. It's a lot of women, they do too much their skin and they're using so many products with fragrances and unnecessary ingredients that they start breaking out and they get irritation of their skin. And so really going down to that basic two minutes, five years younger skincare routine that I give in the book that I just explained to you, that whether you're a guy who's not doing enough or a woman who's doing too much or anywhere in between can really, really help to jumpstart that anti-aging process. I hear so many times about collagen and, and you know, I've been off and on with collagen. I hear so many people saying it doesn't really work. It, it doesn't help. Um, you know, it's snake oil, so to speak. Um, you, you mentioned collagen just a minute ago. Um, give me your thoughts on collagen. Yeah. So yeah, collagen is a large protein. And the argument against it working is that it's such a large protein that your body you know, has to break it down the stomach. And how do you know it's even going to get to your skin? Well, the fact is, is that the collagen supplements that you want to take are hydrolyzed collagen peptides, where they take that large collagen protein and they break it down into individual amino acids or groups of amino acids called peptides. That makes it bioavailable so that you can actually absorb it. And there are a ton of studies that show that taking a hydrolyzed collagen supplement can improve the collagen of your skin. They've even had people take it for two to three months and they biopsied their skin afterwards and have found an increase in the amount of collagen in the skin. So the science is definitely there. If people say the science isn't there, honestly, it's just that they haven't looked for those studies because there are a ton of them, some of them with over a thousand participants. I take, a, I, I take several supplements, um, Tony, but if you had to name the top three that people should take each and every day, if you had to name three, or, or maybe you have a, a greater list, maybe five, uh, what would be the ones you, that would be on that list? So the five that I recommend people start with, uh, and this is all in the book, is number one, the collagen that we mentioned, a daily multivitamin because nutrient depletion is real in our food. Uh, the next one would be an omega-3 fatty acid supplement, uh, fish oil if you're a carnivore. If you're a vegan, then uh, there's great algae-based uh, omega-3 supplements. And then I would recommend a daily probiotic, at least 3 billion colony-forming units. And then finally, an antioxidant supplement, ideally one that contains a variety of antioxidants like resveratrol, because this can fight the oxidation process, which is one of the main causes of aging of our bodies. This is fantastic. I feel like I'm, I'm in social media, Instagram, YouTube, something like this. This is great, Tony. Um, anything else that you want to mention that we haven't talked about that you feel is important for our viewers? We have thousands of people watching us right now. Yeah, one of the things that I recommend people consider trying is just a little bit of intermittent fasting. So we tend to eat food constantly throughout the day, and actually it is healthy for our guts to take a bit of a break. And by taking a good 12 to 16 hours where you're not eating food, you can actually jumpstart the process of autophagy. And this is intracellular renewal. Uh, works great to turn back the clock naturally using autojuvenation. 
I love it. I, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. I do this all the time um, at, at work and during the week, especially. Oh, um, listen, Tony, I, I really appreciate it. Again, the book I'm holding it up right now is Younger for Life, written by Dr. Anthony Yoon. We really appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thanks very much. Congratulations on the book and your social media prowess and, and everything else. Uh, I look forward to seeing you online. Thank you. Please, please tell your wife I said hi. Alrighty, well, thank you for sticking with us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. It's that time of morning where we're going to be talking about something that impacts so many Americans. I know it impacts myself. Allergies. We are in that season, and I feel it. I might sound like it this morning. And so we've got a pretty uh, awesome, awesome person here to chat with us this morning about, you know, seasonal allergies and why they seem to be getting worse this time of year. So I've got Dr. Tessa Sokol here with me, joining me. Dr. Tessa, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Good morning. Good morning. I hope I said your last name right. Can you say that for me again? You said it perfectly. It's Sokol. Yes, you got it right. Sokol, thank you so much for being here with us on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Let's get right to it. Um, I suffer from allergies. They drive me insane most days. Why is it lasting so long right now? What you just said is what I'm hearing from all of my patients. I am getting inundated right now with patients complaining of itchy allergy eyes. With climate change, our allergy season is 40 days longer. And I read one study where the pollen count is 250% higher than what it has in the past. Most of my patients that receive a little bit of reprieve from the allergy when things aren't blooming in the winter are now starting to notice it a lot earlier than they have in the past. Okay, I, I, I'm right there with you because this is something I've been dealing with. Another major thing, itchy eyes. That drives a lot of us crazy because you're constantly rubbing and then touching your hands. It's just too much. So can you talk about what people who have to deal with that itchy eye feeling kind of go through? It is probably one of the worst things that patients complain to me about because your eyes are red, itchy, irritated. It makes it really hard to do your daily activities. A lot of patients in my area work on the computer. It's very hard to look at a computer during the day when your eyes are tearing and your vision's blurry from it. The itchiness can make it very hard to do your job. It can make it hard to go outside and enjoy the outdoors when the weather is finally beautiful. So a lot of patients really come in not feeling good at all. Hey, I feel it. Um, Dr. Sokol, can you tell us what are some things we can do to mitigate this? I know it kind of just comes with the territory for this time of year, but what can we do? If you can work with your primary care doctor to determine what you're allergic to and avoid the allergen, that's the best way to go. If you look at weather channels and weather.com and you see the pollen count is high, maybe avoid going outdoors that day. Close your windows, run air filtration systems. If you're allergic to things indoors like dust or pet dander, try to avoid that. If you can't avoid it, there are products like Extra Strength Pad a Day that can help relieve the itchiness from the allergies that are being causing problems for your eyes. That is really good to know. And then I also wanted you, if you could just kind of hit on just more of how you can manage specifically the eye symptoms. 
That is a great question because I get that from so many of my patients. If they go to the pharmacy and they see an entire wall of eye drops, they think they can choose one and it will help, but they'll still be suffering from the itchy eyes. I send people to pick up extra strength pad a day because one drop put in each eye relieves the itchy feeling within minutes and lasts full 24 hours. It has been proven to outperform Claritin when it comes to the itchy eyes. Hey, that's great to know. I grew up taking Claritin as a kid, so I still suffer, so I might need to take some of this advice in. <laughs> is there anything else you want folks to know, or is there any other uh, resources you have that people can use if they want more information about dealing with these allergies? Pataday is found at most of your local retailers or pharmacies. You can just get it over the counter without a prescription. If you want more information about the product, pataday.com is an excellent website that will offer a tremendous amount of information about how the drop works. All right. Awesome information. Thank you so much for this. Uh, took a lot from it. I know all, all, all of our viewers you know, here in Memphis and everywhere else that watches online will really appreciate this info. So really appreciate your time, Dr. Sokol. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. We all know that age is just a number, right? But for millions of older Americans, particularly those in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, if you are looking for a job, the landscape is very difficult and very challenging. Not only are some of those candidates looking uh, for a job, but they face age bias and discrimination. Older workers, of course, bring all kinds of expertise, maturity, perspective, yet they are often overlooked. Let's talk about this issue with Car uh, Carly Rozowski. She is with AARP joining us on the digital desk this morning. Um, Carly, how bad is it for some of those older Americans in their 50s, 60s, and 70s if they need a job? Good morning. Good morning. Well, many older workers 50 plus do feel that age discrimination can hurt their chances of getting a new job or advancing in their career. New AARP research shows that 64% of workers 50 and older feel and believe they've been discriminated against based on age in the workplace today. You know, I hate to hear that because uh, more and more people are living longer. They're living um, better lives, longer um, longer and healthier quality of life lives as well. You know, 50 now versus 50, you know, 30, 40 years ago is a far different um, age bracket and, and how people are moving around and getting along and the kind of lifestyle they have. Do you have tips for maybe some of those job seekers of older Americans um, to kind of age proof their resume? Sure. We want older workers' resume to reflect the skills and experience they bring and not their age. So we recommend your resume is two pages or less. We make sure that the most relevant and recent experience is highlighted. And while you want to include your credentials, you don't have to include uh, your graduation dates. Don't include your street address. And if you're hanging on to an old AOL or Hotmail email account, uh, switch to a more modern service like Gmail. And one best practice that not only older job seekers, but job seekers of any age could benefit from is to bot proof your resume. So organizations are using bots or these AI powered tools to do an initial screening to eliminate candidates before they're even seen by an actual person. So in order to get past that initial screening, you want to use industry specific terms or specific
specific keywords from the job listings that you're interested in. Do you have examples for us? Well, terms like digital, terms like um, and skills, good communications. Digital native is actually a term we stay away from because older workers tend to not feel that they could apply for a job that describes someone that they're looking for as digital native. But digital skills or skills that they've acquired throughout their career, like good communication, leadership, mentoring, some of those soft skills that uh, older workers tend to bring to the job force are ones that you want to highlight. Has there been a shift, Carly, um, maybe more companies wanting to hire older workers out there? Um, are, are there certain initiatives that uh, employers are putting in place for that? Tell me more. Yeah, so here at AARP, we have an initiative called our Employer Pledge Program that recognizes older experienced workers. And thousands of organizations have signed the pledge since it started in 2012, with almost 500 signing just last year alone. And given employers' need for talent, especially in this tight labor market, it does make good business sense to hire experienced workers. Research also shows that 77% of all workers value their older colleagues for the skills and experience that they're bringing to the job. That's great news. Uh, great news to hear about that. Can we talk about um, networking for a lot of those older Americans looking for a job? Yes, networking is key to a job search. So in conversations with friends or family members, coworkers or former coworkers, make sure to let them know that you're looking for new job opportunities and get their advice or their suggestions. Also, if you're not on LinkedIn, now's a good time to join. Uh, you can stand out to employers by making sure you include a profile photo and filling out the skills section. LinkedIn members that have five skills listed are 27 times more likely to be discovered by recruiters. They also have groups you can join that provide both virtual and in-person networking opportunities. Uh, tell me what the landscape is like for older Americans. I mean, I know you just mentioned that companies are hiring um, older folks here and there. Is it, is it good for them? Is it a good market for them? I know we mentioned uh, off the top that there's, there's some age bias and some age discrimination for some of them out there. Yeah, it's a very strong labor market and unemployment is at historic lows, but we did ask people over 50 earlier this year if they were looking to make a shift in, in their job in 2024 and about 14% said yes. And making more money was the main reason, but also wanting to feel valued and, and looking for more flexible uh, work arrangements. 86% uh, of them did feel confident that they could make a change in 2024. Uh, so I, I believe it's still a positive uh, environment out there for for job seekers. This has been a great conversation, Carly. I appreciate it. Um, tell us about some free resources that AARP has for older Americans that are looking for work, that are looking for a new job. Throughout the month of February, AARP is doing free virtual workshops. Um, and you can register today for a day and time that works best for your schedule at aarp.org slash jobs national. Okay, uh, Carly Rozowski uh, with AARP, we really appreciate the conversation with you and the tips uh, for all those people looking for a job, 50s and beyond. Thanks so very much. News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Have you heard about pickleball? Pickleball is the hottest 
growing sport in the U.S. In the last three years, let me give you an example, it has gone up some 223%. This is according to Sports and Fitness Industry Association. So there's like nearly 50 million adults playing pickleball all year long. Let's bring in a pickleball pro from the Mid-South. I'm joined right now by Jonathan Goodwin. He's pickleball pro at Lifetime Fitness in Collierville. And full disclosure, I know Jonathan. I'm a member there. Uh, Jonathan, it's good to see you this morning. How's it going out there? Are you, How are the pickleball courts? Uh, oh, it's going real good, Andrew. We're actually here right now keeping that, that, that statistics up right now. We got a lot of players with a full courts. We got stacked paddles, and pickleball is booming right now. So tell We're having me a great a time about, this morning. <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. Tell me a little bit about pickleball for someone that's watching you know, we have thousands of people that watch us each and every morning, Jonathan. Maybe someone's watching for the very first time. They know it's a little bit like tennis. Um, how would you describe it, and why is it so popular right now? Well, honestly, pickleball to me is different than any other, any other sport. I love that, you know, you can have grandparents playing with their grandkids, uh, kids playing with their, with their parents. And it's just one good, fun sport where everybody's involved. It's a good social sport. I actually picked this sport up during COVID time, and I haven't looked back yet. So everybody, you can see in the background, everybody's loving this sport. We all having a great time. It's a good, real good social sport. You know, a, a lot of times people thought that pickleball was, was just for maybe the seniors out there, the older Americans. But every time I pass by that area, Jonathan, there's all kinds of people, young, old, male, female, all kind of demographics. What, what makes it so popular? Well, that's one of the things that I also love about pickleball is it's such a big diversity. Like you just mentioned, we have different races, we have different ages, we have different everything. Um, the thing is about now, kids are picking up in the sport, and once a kid has played pickleball his whole life, we're seeing new levels of the sport. But even 78-year-olds, I just lost to some last weekend. That's what I love about the sport is that it's a great diversity sport and you can have a good time playing with whoever and however. You can meet a lot of good people. So um, give me the rules of it. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I've never played it, okay, but I've asked you about it plenty of times. Um, <laughs> so so, so give, me, uh, give me some basic rules. Well, the basic rules is that you always want to remember is stay out of that kitchen. But it's a whole lot of rules to the sport of uh, pickleball. Um, the number one rule that we really abide by, especially in my clinics here at Lifetime, is to have fun. Pickleball is a great sport. It's a fun sport. There's a lot of rules and all that. When you first learn, it can make your head stop popping. But the number one rule that we go by is to have fun regardless of what happens. Like, that's the main thing that we get out of this, um, just to have fun. And after that, all the other rules will go behind it. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that, like, pickleball is taking over, you know, the golf course when it comes to business networking and that sort of thing. Um, can, you, can you shed some light into that? Oh, yeah. Pickleball is definitely taking over. If you ask any pickleball place, we're looking at every square inch of Memphis, and we're trying to see the best place that a pickleball court can go in. I played this sport for three months, and I got to looking in my backyard, Andrew, and I was like, I think I can put a pickleball court in my backyard. So now I have a court in my backyard. So pickleball is definitely taking over because the sport is so fun. And like you mentioned, all ages can play, so it's always a great investment to put pickleball there because it brings a lot of fun, lots of social moments, and just a great time overall. So it's definitely taking over the whole United States right now. <laughs> So, uh, so Jonathan, explain to me the the racket because you know that that I would think would be the number one piece of equipment you need. How is it different from from a, a tennis racket, racquetball, squash, that sort of thing? Yeah, so this is actually one of the more traditional rackets right here, um, and the difference is, you know, tennis rackets have the big springs and have the big what's the name? These right here is real comfortable, like you said, for singers and all that, where singers. Not just holding this big heavy racket where it hurts their hand or have wrist issues and stuff like that. And it's just a good comfortable paddle. Uh, table tennis, more of a smaller paddle. So this right here is kind of like a fusion of different sports, of, you know, just a different sports of, of uh, playing like paddle ball. So this is the one that we use for pickleball right here. 
Is that the only piece of equipment that you need? Uh, what would you recommend for somebody who's, you know, wants to start out who, their first lesson or second lesson? What, what would you tell them to bring? Well, so at Lifetime, we teach a whole lot of clinics. And um, when we do our beginner clinics, what we tell them to bring is a paddle. If they don't have a paddle, we let them loan a paddle here at Lifetime Fitness uh, to bring tennis shoes. Your, your most important thing is to have good pickleball shoes because you don't want to come in something that doesn't support your ankle or anything like that. But other than that, pickleball is really not the most expensive sport to get into. It's just really to come with a real positive attitude and have a good time and Mostly, that's all you need, Andrew, just to jump into the sport, unless you want to do like what I did and buy a whole pickleball court. <laughs> <laughs> I know you really like it. Um, so so let me ask you this. Um, we've done some stories of gauging the popularity of pickleball. We've done stories about all these people getting pickleball injuries, uh, mainly older Americans. What kind of injuries uh, come from pickleball? Well, sometimes with pickleball, I would say – um, it's not honestly a real big injury sport, but I would say the, the sport that the injuries that come from the sport is mainly could be avoided. A lot of times you're so excited about playing pickleball that you don't take those few minutes to stretch before pickleball and stuff like that. So for me personally, 75 degrees outside, I was playing pickleball and I just jumped right in and I hurt my lower back from just jumping in the sport. But that could have been avoided if I just would have took five to 10 minutes stretch so the number one thing i'll say is to control the excitement and to take that time to stretch before you play because other than that it's not really a big injury sport because of the low impact of the sport say so it's a real good sport to jump in that's why a lot of seniors are in it because the low impact of the sport but it can get physical too as the better you get i got you i got you so mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. how does that how does the scoring work is it is it like tennis is it like uh some other sport? What is it? So the biggest thing with scoring, this is what I teach every class here at Lifetime Also, the best thing to remember when you're playing doubles in pickleball is every game starts off 0-0-2. Zero, zero, so when I say 0-0-2, zero, zero, just like basketball, soccer, anything like that, it starts off 0-0. Zero, zero. But in pickleball, it starts with the second server. So that's the biggest thing. So once that second server or that team has messed up, and it goes to the next team, and they would say zero, zero, one. So each server gives an opportunity to serve the ball. Only on the beginning of the game does, you know, do you start off with server number two. So that's the most confusing thing of pickup ball, but once you get that concept, then it kind of goes downhill from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Anything else you want to mention, Jonathan, uh, with regards to pickup ball? If someone's mm -hmm. watching this for the first time, they might want to check it out. Anything else you want to mention about it? Well, just like you know, Andrew, I'm always trying to talk you into pickleball. I'm always telling people to get into pickleball, especially here at Lifetime Gym, because Lifetime Gym just, as you see in the background, if it's a rainy day, it's a cloudy day, we're still here playing pickleball. Um, also have workouts. We have a cafeteria to eat in. We have pool area. We have outdoor pool. So the same thing with pickleball is you'll have a great opportunity. Me, my family tried to talk me into pickleball for the longest. I did not want to take up the sport. But then I finally, they finally caught me up on vacation, and now here I am teaching pickleball. So this is one sport that you would not regret. It's a good time. It's a great way to have a good time with your friends. And everybody has somebody who's playing this sport right now, whether it's your coworker, whether it's your aunt, grandparent. So it's a good sport to jump in so you can stay in touch with your friends and family also. So come nice. on, Andrew, we're looking for you too, Andrew. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I got to do it. I got to try it, Jonathan. Well, listen, I, I appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so very much. I know pickleball is the hottest growing sport in the U.S., and uh, it, you sold it this morning. So uh, we appreciate your time, Jonathan. Thanks so very much. All right, thank you. I have to get back on the course, okay? <laughs> All right. We'll see you.
Good morning, everyone. Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Earth Day is April 22nd. It's a time to raise awareness about protecting the Earth for future generations. I'm joined right now by actress Heather Morris, uh, known for her starring role in TV shows Glee. She was also a finalist with Dancing with the Stars. You can currently see her on So Help Me, Todd. Heather, good morning. How are you? What is up, Andrew in Memphis? How are you? We are doing great. Thank you so much. Um, tell me about some of the um, items you have there. I, I suspect they're environmentally safe. Yeah, so I just came back from my travels in Vancouver where I was shooting season two of So Help Me Todd with Skylar Aston and Marsha Gay Harden. And I love and I'm a nerd about all these eco-friendly habits. So I'm here for some tips for you. Um, so, you know, little conscious changes at home we can make is a big difference for us. Turning to cold water washing with Tide is an easy eco habit. Um, it's a great way to start off this Earth Month. It's also a great way to save money and help your clothes last longer. You know, it is hard for us to change a habit when you're not sure if it'll work. So that's why Tide is created specifically to deliver a great clean in cold water, making that sustainable choice the easy one. Tide has been on a journey to reduce the climate impact of laundry and has set a goal to turn 75% of loads to cold by 2030. All right. Well, tell us, um, Heather, what are some simple ways that people can help out this Earth Day and, and really support and recognize the, the specific day. Well, I mean, if you're anything like me and my family, I have two boys, we love to travel. And when I'm traveling, um, I'm always looking for ways to go green. So I recommend choosing Travel Lodge by Wyndham. They are all about that sustainability, including an ongoing commitment to preserve our nation's parks. It's amazing. So in fact, more than 75% of all those Travel Lodge hotels are less than an hour's drive from the national park, making it that perfect base camp for your next adventure. They are also running a great Great Earth Day deal where you can get 20% off when you stay two nights or more. Check out TravelLodge.com for all those details. What about uh, some environmentally friendly ways to save on energy and money? Well, an amazing way to save money on your energy bills and help protect the planet is Savant Power. Now, a Savant Power system allows you to store your solar energy if you have it or inexpensive energy from your utility company, using it to power your home or charge your car each day when energy prices are spiking. Plus, it can also be used to provide clean power to your home if there's a blackout. And in some parts of the country, Savant Power users are already saving hundreds of dollars on their monthly utility bills. We love that. To learn more and get started, visit Savant.com. What about the food supply and its impact on the environment, Heather? Yes, a, a great subject we love to talk about. Did you actually know that 38% of food in the U.S. goes unsold or uneaten and a lot of it due to outdated grocery standards. So Misfits Market is an online grocery store um, on a mission to reduce food waste and make shopping for sustainable, high quality groceries easier and more affordable for us. They deliver organic produce, quality meats and seafoods, plant-based proteins, pantry stables, dairy and quality brands you love. Misfits Markets help save an average of a half a million pounds of food per week. So consumers can feel good about supporting their wonderful mission. Anything else we can touch on before we let you go, Heather? If you want to learn more about any anything you see here, go to tipsontv.com. That is tipsontv.com. Um, and I did want to share my lovely outfit today. If you have a chance to feature it, um, it is upcycled clothing, and I'm always looking for great new ways to go vintage. I love it. I love it. Heather Morris, I appreciate you joining us. Good luck on the, on the next season of So Help Me, Todd. Thanks so very much for being thank here. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Okay, thank you. The live look from our high five camera there in Midtown Memphis. Uh, it's actually outside the University of Memphis. We got the Tiger spring game coming up next weekend. We'll be talking more about that on the digital desk. We got your forecast in 60 seconds.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west. They're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the Mid-South. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days. It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy, not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. that will top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday to early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. That will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some often on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again, the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. Okay, Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. There has been a new book released, and I'm holding it right now. It's called Raising Mentally Strong Kids, How to Combine the Power of Neuroscience 
with love and logic to grow confident, kind, responsible, and resilient children and young adults. We all want this for our kids, for our grandkids in this ever-changing and very challenging world. I am joined on the digital desk and really honored to be joined by Dr. Daniel Amen. He is someone I've been seeing on social media for years and years and years. I've heard him on podcasts. I've read a lot of his stuff, especially the brain scan. So fascinated by this. He is one of the co-authors of this book, and it is a book that certainly is relevant today. In fact, Dr. Amen has written 18 books on the New York Times bestseller list. He joins us now on the digital desk. Big fan, Dr. Amen. How are you this morning? Thank you so much. I am just so grateful to uh, share this message with you. I appreciate you being here. So tell me why th you wrote this book and why it's so critical right now. Well, kids are in historic trouble. A uh, brand new study from the CDC that said 57% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 24% have planned to kill themselves. I mean, think about that. 13% have actually tried. These are statistics never seen before in recorded history. Why? Uh, from the rise in social media to the pandemic that changed all of our brains, uh, to the low quality food, to the toxic products we put on children's bodies, our own bodies, we need a different way. And I partnered with my friend, Dr. Charles Fay, the president of the Love and Logic Institute, one of the best parenting programs ever developed. Uh, and the reason we put that together is there's no neuroscience, there's no brain science in parenting with love and logic. And we decided raising mentally strong kids needed to have a foundation of neuroscience with the wonderful uh, parenting with love and logic program. Dr. Amen, you're one of the top neuropsychiatrists in the country and you have a brain scan um, that you've patented. I've, I've heard you talk about it so many times before. In fact, my wife and I would share with our kids what a brain looks like when they are um, on drugs or um, a, a daily uh, a, a person who uh, smokes marijuana on a daily basis or has a drink every day versus a brain scan of someone healthy. Is that are those factors contributing to the kind of issues you just mentioned where, um, you know, people are just, they, their brains are on fire, right? But very few people, I mean, thank you for that question. Very few people love and care for their brains. And 33 years ago, now I started looking at the brain. And as a psychiatrist, you know, most psychiatrists never look at the brain. And I'm like, oh my goodness, these are not mental health problems, they're brain health problems. What do I need to do to get my brain healthy and the brains of my babies and children healthy? And it just, it changes the whole conversation uh, rather than you need to take this or that medicine for your mental health problems, you need to get your brain healthy. And that means you need to sleep, you need to eat right, you need to exercise. Here are some simple supplements. And we have a poster that hangs in over 100,000 schools and prisons and churches called Which Brain Do You Want? Healthy scans surrounded by drug-affected scans. And you realize marijuana is not innocuous and alcohol is not a health food. We need to be really clear, but if you understand societal messages, oh, marijuana is innocuous, it's a lie. Teenagers who use marijuana have an increased risk of anxiety, depression, and suicide in their 20s. Um, we need to give accurate, positive, hopeful messages to our children. 
Thank you for saying that. I, I feel like uh, you're um, one of the voices that is very consistent about saying those kind of things, those detrimental effects that marijuana has. I just wish more people um, with your type of background would uh, speak up about that issue because it's certainly a prevalent issue and it seems more prevalent year after year. Um, so you've written this book, back to the book here, which I have a copy of. Uh, you sent it to us. Thank you very much. The one message you want parents and grandparents, for that matter, to take away from this book. You want to raise mentally strong kids. And who among us doesn't? I'm a father of six. You have to model the message. So it really does start with you. If mental strength, knowing what you want, being able to persistently act in positive ways to get it over time, not believing every stupid thing you think, we call it killing the ants, absolutely essential that parents model it. And in that way, because children do what you do, not what you tell them to do. And so this book will help you, but it'll also help you be the best dad or the best mom, uh, the best grandma, the best grandpa that you can be. Dr. Amon, can you give us an example, perhaps, of, of a powerful exercise um, from that book? You, you know, my favorite exercise is start every day with your kids today is going to be a great day uh, and when you put them to bed at night go what went well today and let's start at the beginning of your day and just let's go through the day looking at what was right positivity bias getting your brain to look for what's right rather than what's wrong protects you from virtually all of the mental health problems we're facing. I love it, I love it. Positivity is so valuable and so easy to do. It's just creating a different mindset. Um, Dr. Amen, I, I, I also wanted to ask you, if someone wanted to get their brain scanned, I know that you have clinics all over the country. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe you have any here in Memphis or the Mid-South. How would someone go about getting their brain scanned just to kind of see if it's healthy or not. So our closest clinic, I think it's Atlanta, um, that they just have to go to amenclinics.com and fill out the intake form or call the number. And we would love to see them because, you know, the brain is the most important organ in the body, but very few people actually ever look at it. And so getting a look at how healthy your brain is and then getting a plan to optimize it is so special uh, for people. One final thing before we let you go, Dr. Amen. Um, how much of, of the brain health or the, the, the detrimental aspects of brain health can be contributed or can be, um, can be as a result looked at with this smartphone that the, the smartphone technology that is constantly barraging uh, kids, teens everywhere, how much of a detrimental effect does that have in our brain? I think it's very large. Uh, they're dopamine dumping devices. Uh, so whenever you get a notification or an email you like, or you know, a TikTok video that makes you laugh, it's dumping a little bit of dopamine. The problem is we're wearing out the pleasure centers in the brain with these devices. We're getting into this dopamine deficit state, which is why kids are bored, why they are um, distracted, uh, why they're sad. Uh, we've unleashed this technology on a whole population without any neuroscience research, the neuroscientists were used to hook, you know, okay, how do, how do we use neuroscience to get more mind share to basically hook their attention? Take the devices away from them when kids go to bed. Now, you have to limit them, you have to put parental controls on them, 
but take them away from your children so they don't take them to bed. Amen. Dr. Amen, I uh, certainly appreciate that. That is, uh, that is well, well said. Um, we, I, I really miss your podcast, by the way. I enjoy it when you're on other podcasts. Um, but uh, for anyone out there that wants to see Dr. Amen and, and more of his content, you can do so on TikTok. He's got millions of followers, and you're posting stuff each and every day. Thanks so much for com uh, coming on the Digital Desk. We have thousands of people that watch each and every day, and I know uh, it's beneficial for so many of them. And, uh, and I appreciate you writing this book. Um, anything else before we let you go, doctor? Well, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. And, you know, people can get Raising Mentally Strong Kids anywhere. Great books are sold. It's just out this week. And uh, we're praying that it makes a big difference. Dr. Daniel Amen, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Walking still remains an ideal exercise, especially for older adults uh, aiming to increase their activity levels. There's so many benefits when it comes to walking. It's very simple and it can do profound things for a person's health. Better sleep, uh, regulated mental health, reduced risk of cardiovascular complications and improved overall quality of life. Let's talk more about this issue with Dr. Jana Robinson, uh, Medical Director of Oak Street Health. Uh, Dr. Robinson, good morning. Thank you for coming on the digital desk. Um, tell me more about why walking is so beneficial to some of the older Americans out there. Good morning. Andrew, thank you for having me. Walking is a very easy exercise that can be done anywhere and actually has a lot of the benefits for our adult older adult community. Um, we are seeing recent studies that simply walking briskly for 30 minutes a day, four times a week, improves um, mental clarity uh, and actually decreases uh, the risk of developing Alzheimer's. We are seeing that it does a bunch of different things, including reduce stress and help sleep as well. Yeah, so, um, so give me the idea behind the guidelines of 30 minutes a day, four times, each week? These guidelines come from a recent study that was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease Reports. And they took a group of previously sedentary people between the ages of in their 70s and 80s. And they were also experiencing some mild cognitive de decline. And they had them briskly walk for 30 minutes, four times a week. In just a few months, they actually saw improvement in their brain function. So that's where some of this recommendation comes from. There's also been several studies um, talking about the 10,000 step day rule, where a recent one show for our older adults, people over the age of 65, getting in somewhere between six and 8,000 steps actually offer the same benefit as a young person or a younger person walking 10,000 steps a day. I'm curious about the mental health aspects. We know about the physical aspects of walking. Tell me about the, the cognition and does it matter where you walk? Um, could it be an urban area, a rural area? Is there a difference? Are there more benefits with one or the other? What are you saying? There aren't more benefits one way or another. Of course, being outside in nice weather is always beautiful. You get a little extra vitamin D, but walking 
in general, regardless of where you walk, does help your not only your physical health, but your mental health as well. Um, there's a little bit of benefit to being outside and walking with other people. You get the socialization and reduce your isolation. Um, walking in the sunshine can help treat and decrease symptoms of seasonal depression, um, which is often associated with being inside in the winter. Um, but walking in general just helps reduce stress and improve sleep quality. Yes, yeah, some places, unfortunately, in Memphis, there, um, you know, there's there's a crime issue, um, and and I guess people can drive and perhaps go to, you know, Shelby Farms Park, uh, uh, and some other areas, maybe some parks. Um, what would you recommend for someone who uh, might be a little concerned about, you know, going outside and and walking? Yeah real problem that you know it's a it's a actual problem that we have here in memphis um our community centers like our ymcas have wonderful places to walk um oak street our community rooms offer regular exercise um, classes that are open to all the older adults you don't have to be our patient to participate in those in our community rooms and um definitely can we can offer things like walking clubs at oak street if there's community interest so Walking with a group of people is definitely uh, can make people feel more safe. If none of those things are options for you, even simply walking in place or walking in a path around your home will give you benefit. So many uh, different benefits here. Um, what else can we talk about uh, with regards to the benefits of walking? So, again, benefits there it's endless um exercise in general walking being a wonderful exercise that anybody can do it doesn't take any equipment with the exception of proper shoes and a bottle of water um you can anybody can do that you can start slow and work your way up uh, which is a great way to decrease your stress levels and um in, improve your health people who exercise regardless of their age or conditions actually live longer than those who don't um, so it is it is a really great thing to add to your repertoire if you aren't doing it. Older adults should take precaution, though, with our days warming up. But we want older adults are easily more dehydrated, so they want to make sure they hydrate and wear proper fitting shoes and clothing. OK, uh, Dr. Jana Robinson, we appreciate your time. Uh, Senior Medical Director of Oak Street Health. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on the digital desk. We appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Each year in the U.S., hundreds of people die during pregnancy or in the year after birth. Thousands more have unexpected outcomes of labor and delivery with serious short-term or long-term health consequences. And the problem is only getting worse, especially among African Americans. Let's bring in someone who knows more about this topic. I'm joined now by Chanel Portia Albert, founder, executive director of Ancient Song Doula Services. Um, good morning to you. Tell me how bad the problem is. Good morning. Thank you for having me on this morning. Um, yes, we're looking at a situation that um, has been exasperated. Um, you know, Black uh, women and everything, people are three to four times more likely to die of childbirth-related complications um, in our nation. And um, that's sad, right? Um, and, they're, and they're also preventable deaths. We're looking at um, occurrences in which um, individuals are either seeking out care and cannot find accessible care. We're looking at the ways in which insurance has played a huge role um, as well in accessibility. 
And then we're looking at healthcare infrastructure, right? Not having enough staffing. Um, we're also looking at the underlying, some of the underlying causes such as racism and bias within healthcare. So how do we fix it? <laughs> well, that, that's like a million dollar question. Um, but I think um, it takes a concerted effort from all of us, right? Looking at the ways in which, one, we are training medical providers to work from a culturally humble perspective. And so what does it mean to learn with a patient, um, meeting them where they are, not where we expect them to be, but also, you know, creating a strategic plan for care um, that is culturally responsive, understanding the ways in which people respond to medical care and understanding the impact that racism has had in um, individuals being able to access care and how that, that perception of those individuals has been historically. I think we're also looking at um, building up the perinatal workforce. So we need more midwives. We need more OBGYNs, um, not just of color, but also just to be in our respective areas and neighborhoods. You know, if you live in a rural area, you find yourself, um, you know, sometimes having to travel two to three hours to get to the nearest um, hospital facility. You know, by that time, now you have maybe a chronic condition that could have been avoided had you had access to um, health care within your area. And then we're looking at legislative policy. And so through the Momnibus Act that was uh, that came out of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, you have 12 bills that are bipartisan that look at how we can build up the infrastructure around maternal health how we can um, collect data and make sure that we're getting enough information to continue to inform how people are accessing care, but then also looking at the ways in which, um, you know, we're just supporting um, uh, the providers who are providing that care every single day. So Black Maternal Health Week is April 11th through the 17th. If people are watching here, they want to support this, what can they do? Um, I would say find a local community-based organization um, around you. There are organizations such, the Black, such as the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is a national organization where you can find a list of organizations from all across the nation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it starts as easy as having a conversation, asking questions to your provider about care and what your options are, but also seeking out a doula, um, a midwife, and an OB to really help you to guide you through your pregnancy. Um, and that's where you can start. <clears throat> okay, anything else um, you wanna to touch on before we let you go? Yeah, I think um, overall, I wanna say that um, a lot of this I think is based on us seeing our collective humanity. And when we take the opportunity to see our own humanity, it becomes easier to reflect that back to others. And so as we are, working with one another as we're, you know, understanding that, you know, one thing affects the other person. It's never just a singular event that we must continue to uplift one another as we're, you know, centering maternal health, black maternal health, um, but reproductive health access in general within our nation. All right, Chanel, Portia, Albert, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You do the same. Thank you very much. Another live look from our high five camera there in downtown Memphis, 67 degrees, 834. We're back with your forecast in 60 seconds.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west, they're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the mid south. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days. It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots, though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy. Not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. that will top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us. And here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend that will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's gonna be some off and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend amid the cooler temperatures lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again, the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. There are so many studies these days that link your dental health to the overall body health. So in other words, there is more and more studies that say if you are not healthy in here, you're not going to be healthy in mentally or physically. 
And so it is so important to teach proper dental care from the very beginning for some of our youngest all the way up to um, our seniors out there. Let's talk about uh, children's dental health right now. I'm joined uh, by Mead Moore, pediatric dentist on the Action News 5 digital desk. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. So uh, tell me how much of an issue this is here in Memphis and the Mid-South. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Um, it's not just a problem here in Memphis, which it is, but it's also a problem uh, nationwide. According to the uh, Centers for Disease Control, 56% of kids between the age of six and eight have untreated um, dental caries. And that's a huge number. And it can be uh, reduced by people, parents taking care of their kids a little bit better and getting uh, professional consultations early. Uh, I like to see kids as early as one, one years old to check their enamel, uh, ask parents about how they clean their teeth. It's a big problem. And there's nothing worse than, that, than a child having a toothache. It's really devastating. They can't eat, they can't sleep. Sometimes they can't even go to school. It's a real problem here in, here in Memphis too. Yeah, I understand that um, your offices are in Germantown. Uh, tell me about um, your clientele when it comes to, because you're a pediatric dentist, what do you see the most in terms of uh, problems that some of the children's teeth uh, have? The, the biggest problem is that uh, parents are not um, diligent enough to keep the teeth clean uh, during the day. For example, um, I'm recommending to parents clean the teeth at least twice a day, especially, most importantly, before they go to bed. A lot of kids get tired, they get whiny, they're not cooperative, they want to go to bed, they're tired. Well, I recommend to parents, go ahead and clean their teeth with a toothbrush, or um, there's a, a product called Spiffies, which is a wet wipe for parents to wrap around their finger and then wipe it over the gums and get the gums clean, get the teeth clean before they go to bed. Or start brushing the teeth earlier. You have to brush the teeth before they go to bed because the plaque builds up quickly. Plaque has bacteria. Bacteria secretes acids and acids hurts the gum tissue and forms cavities. You know, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there, doctor, um, and, and I'm sure you see it in your practice uh, almost on a, I'm sure, a daily, if, if not a weekly basis, where people's misconceptions about uh, dental care for children, oh, they have baby teeth, they're going to be fine, or, uh, you know, hey, they, you don't need to worry about this until their permanent teeth come out, but it, it's about habits, right? I mean, it, explain some of the misconceptions yes. out there. Yeah, uh, this, is the, this is a real big misconception. I can't tell you how many times we hear the, the sense, well, they're just baby teeth. Why do I need to fix them? Why do I need to spend the money to fix them? If you've ever seen a child that has extensive decay and even infections, abscesses, uh, their faces are swollen, they're hurting, they can't eat, they can't sleep. Um, it's a real tragedy. Um, and like I say, there's so many kids out there that are, have untreated carries that it's just, it's really surprising in this day and time that this is happening. So you have to uh, be diligent about teaching your kids how to brush early and clean their teeth all the time. Um, you know, I don't have any Coca-Colas or Colas at our house. We just don't drink that because it's really bad for your teeth. But people really have another misconception about how bad potato chips are. Fritos and all the chips that you see in the grocery stores, that's just full of carbohydrates. And you put that in the mouth, you chew it, it becomes a paste. If you don't clean the paste off, if you don't clean the potato chips off the teeth, that can cause cavities as well. It's very um, strange to see how quickly a cavity can form if you don't clean the teeth and get the carbohydrates and the sugars off. Um, so when I talk to parents, I say, okay, here's what you need to do. If they won't brush, use a wet wipe, a, a type of wet wipe calls a spiffies. I don't get any kickback from that. I just know it works uh, for kids. They wipe it off, wipe the plaque off the gums, off the teeth, and that way they can go to bed without any problems developing cavities while they sleep. So let me ask you this. Um, what, about, what about a bullet? 
bullet points for parents out there of young children. Um, what do you tell them in terms of providing the best oral care for your child when you're not going to see a dentist? Um, all right, first of all, I'm going to back up one second and say it's very important for you to take your child to a pediatric dentist at the age of one or earlier if you see a problem. Genetics plays a big role in this also. Uh, I was just talking to a parent 20 minutes ago. He had terrible teeth when he was a child, and now the child um, luckily does not have any cavities, but I told she's prone to it. Be sure and clean their teeth very well. Let the dentist uh, check their teeth every six months. In my office, I'll see the children under age three for an exam and check their progress and make sure they're cleaning right. At age three, we start the cleaning process, and they, by the time they're three, they're used to the office. They feel like it's a safe environment. The parents come back with uh, the child, and we go very slow. I want to make sure it's not like they're going to the pediatrician's office. They, they're not going to get a shot at the dental office, okay, in the arm, in the leg, or anything. So I want this to be a safe place, a place they feel comfortable, but they have to clean their teeth at home. Parents have to watch out what kind of foods that they're feeding, like the carbohydrates, the sugars. Um, when I first got out of dental school, going, putting the child to bed with a bottle full of either orange juice, Coca-Cola, or some other sugary drink was really rampant, especially here in Memphis. That's gotten a lot better, and that's due to public education. So it's watching what they eat, keep their teeth clean, and flossing. Now, flossing is a really interesting concept. Um, you know, people use the little floss around their fingers, but there's now called um, floss sticks. You get them at the drugstore, you get them at the grocery store, and they're much easier to maneuver around the child's teeth. So flossing also is very important to start. Around age three is what I recommend. Yeah, I have, I have those, and my wife and I use them all the time. My kids are um, in college, and so, you know, we've, uh, we've done our best uh, to... Uh, ensure uh, oral uh, health and, and take him to a pediatric dentist uh, every six months. I guess it sounds like, you know, you, children's dental care and adult dental care are virtually the same, it seems like. Brush twice a day, see a, a dentist uh, every six months or so, and, uh, and just get regular checkups. Um, am I wrong with that? No, that's perfectly right. That's exactly right. Now, when you and I grew up, um, I was never told to floss. I mean, I don't think I flossed till I was in my late teens. Um, I didn't think that was necessary. I thought it was only to get chicken or corn from between your teeth. It was never told to me that you're supposed to be flossing to prevent decay. And that's the big change in the past 30 years, 20 years. And uh, people are now flossing a lot more. I drill this into uh, all my patients. And the first question I ask the older patients, because they've been with me maybe a long time, I say, okay, tell me about your flossing. How you doing? And they know I'm going to ask that question. And most of them are very sheepish and say, uh, I flossed about two weeks after I saw you, but then I quit. Well, I always drill it into the head. Please floss. It's not for my benefit. It's for yours. So flossing it with those floss sticks is great. One final thing before we let you go, Dr. Moore, uh, there's a big push to eliminate fluoride in drinking waters across the country. Some municipalities have done it um, because a uh, higher content of fluoride is uh, known to uh, damage the body in a number of different ways. Where do you stand on that? Oh, um, I think fluoride in uh, the drinking water is extremely important. We see a huge difference and the number of cavities kids have if they're on well water, say in Tennessee or Mississippi, versus kids who are drinking fluoridated water in Memphis. There's a dramatic change here. Um, I think the misconception is um, that you're getting too much fluoride. And then the biggest controversy is how much fluoride do you need in toothpaste? Do you want fluoride in toothpaste for a three-year-old, a two-year-old? My suggestion is a very small amount of toothpaste no matter if it's fluoridated or not. But I recommend no fluoride until age three or four when they can spit. That's the key. If they're swallowing the toothpaste, I don't want them to have the fluoride. Uh, they can damage permanent teeth and make their stomach upset. So when they learn to spit, 
that's when you switch over to fluorinated toothpaste. But the fluoride in drinking water is extremely, I can't emphasize this enough, extremely important to prevent decay. And, and, and we're so lucky here in Memphis we have that. All right, Dr. Mead Moore, we appreciate you and, and everything that you do at, at your pediatric dentist business there. Thank you so much for uh, giving us an idea and really kind of shedding a light on how you should treat your children's um, oral health compared to uh, an adult's oral health. Thanks so very much. All right, good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. April 13th, that is a Saturday, there is an event uh, going on at Methodist. It's at the uh, transplant um, area at Methodist Le Bonheur hosting an event with, for patients and loved ones uh, who are currently waiting for an organ. Um, let's bring in uh, someone who knows more about this event, um, Gayatri. Uh, J Jai Shanker uh, is an administrator for Methodist Transplant Institute, um, and she's here to give us more information about uh, this event on Saturday, April 13th. Uh, good morning, Gayatri. Uh, tell us about it. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you for having me this morning and giving me a chance to talk about this great event that we are going to be hosting this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Um, the event is called the Big Ask, Big Give. It is in partnership with the National Kidney Foundation. Um, and it essentially is um, an education program for the community, both for patients who are waiting for a kidney transplant or for anybody uh, who knows of somebody who is waiting for a kidney transplant um, on how you can be a living donor. Um, so not only does it teach the patients um, various um, approaches and, you know, having those crucial conversations to get a living donor, uh, but also teaches uh, their loved ones how they can be advocates for the patients um, during this journey for them. How many people are on the list currently for a kidney transplant, Gayatri? So for a kidney transplant, we have almost 670 patients on the list just here in Memphis. Um, and many of them, the only chance for them to get a uh, kidney transplant is through deceased donation. Um, deceased donation, however, is a considerable wait time. Um, and for anybody on dialysis, you know that um, every year on dialysis is um, just so difficult and so uh, life changing for them in terms of um, their condition. Um, and so we want to educate the community that another way of getting a kidney transplant and probably the faster, more healthier way of getting a kidney transplant is through living donation. Um, and the Big Ask, Big Give is focused around living donation as a treatment option for kidney transplant. Is this event on Saturday just for patients on the list for a, a, an organ or um, is this for other people? So in other words, is this for the patients and the families that are currently on a list waiting for an organ or is this for the broad general public? That's a great question. So it is for both. Um, you know, it's targeted at patients who um, are waiting for a kidney transplant because it is most beneficial to them. And of course, their family members as they help their loved ones on this journey. But really, it's a community event because anybody can be a living donor. Uh, we have something called altruistic donors 
where uh, people just out of the goodness of their heart um, want to give the ultimate gift to somebody, which is um, being a living donor for somebody. And so this is a great program for you to understand what it means to be a living donor and make a more informed decision. Okay, and uh, and so uh, living donor obviously is, is part of the conversation on Saturday. How does someone know if they're an appropriate candidate to be a living donor? Um, we have a team of wonderful nephrologists and amazing surgeons who do a very, very uh, thorough evaluation for anybody who may be interested in being a living donor. Um, so after the medical evaluation, um, if you qualify on the various criteria that we have, on who can become a living donor, then we would put you through an evaluation and consider that. Um, the reason we do that is because, um, you know, here's somebody who is healthy and uh, just out of the goodness of their heart, um, they want to come up and be a living donor for somebody. So not only is it our responsibility, but also an obligation to the living donor that we ensure that um, it is a safe option for them and post donation, they can go back to a healthy, happy life as they knew it. I was just going to ask, tell me about the recovery process for a donor. What is it like? Um, how, how severe is it? And what kind of quality of life can a donor achieve after donation? Yeah. So um, we do uh, most living donor surgeries um, are laparoscopic. Um, the recovery time uh, for a living donor in the hospital immediately post donation is only about three to four days and most donors are able to go back uh, to their house after three to four days. Complete recovery takes about four to eight, eight weeks and uh, most donors are able to go back to all of their normal activities, their day to day activities in about four to eight weeks. Gotcha. Anything else that we can touch on before we let you go about this event, perhaps um, where people can get information about it online? Yes, um, we will have all of the information available on our Methodist Labona Facebook page. Um, and I definitely encourage everyone to stop by the page, get more information on this event. Um, we are really, really excited about this event. You know, last year we um, were able to do 348 organ transplants uh, because of various gifts that both deceased and living donors were able to give our patients and give them a second chance of life. Um, so we are very excited about this program uh, and all that it has to offer, and we are looking forward to hosting it this Saturday. All right, Gayatri, Jess Shanker, we appreciate you. Um, good luck with the event, and um, we, we appreciate all the info you've given us this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west, they're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to 
to build into the area. And I think by this afternoon, you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the mid south. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms, I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again, you'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy, not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. It'll top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight, early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. And that will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some off and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend. Amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again, the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. You're taking a live look outside the University of Memphis campus, 67 degrees. Very nice today. It's going to be shaping up to be an amazing day. And this weekend, we had the Tigers spring football game. Let's talk with Josh Moore now uh, about the big game that's coming up this Saturday. Josh, good morning. How are you? Doing well. Any uh, week that starts out with Memphis football uh, back in action is a, a good week. Yeah, so tell me about um, this game that's coming up April 20th. It'll be uh, on Saturday. Uh, tell me about it because I know a lot of people are going to want to go. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, it's an awesome event. It's it's free admission, free parking. Uh, you don't have to pay anything to to go or or anything like that. Um, and then outside of the game uh, at Tiger Lane at one p.m., uh, we start opening with the the inflatables. We've got food trucks out there, uh, face painters. A, a perfect day for the kids um, out at Tiger Lane. And then inside of the stadium, uh, something for the adults. We have three dollar beers uh, during the game. So. Uh, uh, not more perfect than than uh, a Saturday watching Memphis football, three dollar beers and, and something to, to have your kids run around and, and get tired with uh, game kicks off at 3 p.m. And it's it's really going to be an awesome event. Um, it's a family friendly event and, and really anyone from the city can can come out to this. You know, I, I've been so many times in the past and it is you're right, a family fun event. It's a, it's 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 a nice atmosphere to go and check out. Uh, the team and, and how they're going to do and, and perhaps, you know, just kind of enjoy yourself and, and make a day of it. Um, you know, can you can you talk a little bit about how the team's going to look? I understand it's kind of a some people refer to it as a glorified practice. But uh, can you talk about the team and what what uh, what we might see on the football field? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be uh, uh, three quarters, three kind of uh, sessions, periods uh, of practice. Um, and so what, uh, they're broken up each in, in a kind of different way, but the teams will be broken up in, into a red and black team. So it's not a, not a full game. Sometimes they might start off on the 20 yard line, you know, working on their red zone office. Sometimes they might start on the one yard line, working on their goal line offense. So it's not a full game, but you'll see, you know, uh, your typical action packed games and, and stuff like that. It's, it's football on the field. It's not like they're running drills or anything like that. Uh, they're split up in teams and then. Uh, another thing that the football team is doing that will be a ton of fun on the field is uh, they're going to be taking on students in different competitions. So we'll actually have uh, eight football players taking on three students on the field and tug of war uh, dodgeball will be happening on the field. So not only do you have the competition on the field versus the teams, but you also have a competition versus uh, football versus students on the field. That's going to be a ton of fun to watch. Yeah, I feel like the last few years, these kind of spring football games have taken on a, a, a life of its own, making it a little bit more exciting, fun, different, dynamic. Uh, that that sounds great. So when does the um, when does the stadium open? Um, it, when can people start tailgating? Yeah, so parking lot uh, opens at 11 a.m. Stadium opens at uh, uh, gates open to go inside the stadium at 2 p.m. Uh, kickoff at 3 um, and then after the game as well, we, we have post-game autographs on the field uh, with the players. So you can come down to, to the field, meet your favorite players, uh, maybe run around the, the end zone to catch a touchdown or something like that, um, and just meet all of your favorite Memphis Tigers, Seth Hennigan, Rock Taylor. Uh, a lot of those players will be uh, signing autographs on the field. And it's, it's really uh, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to go on the field and meet your favorite Memphis Tigers players. That sounds great, and I know that um, that there are some transfers coming in from other schools, uh, hoping to make an impact in the um, in the gray and blue, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, with the transfer portal nowadays, it's it's always a change in team. But honestly, we're we're, we're lucky here uh, to to have Seth Hennigan and Rock Taylor and uh, Greg Rubin coming back uh, as kind of people that committed to Memphis out of high school. Uh, but then we also do have a couple awesome transfers coming in. That's um, you know, the, it's an always ever changing roster, but um, you know, the transfer portal, this is your first chance to come watch some of those kids play. Um, and that's what I keep telling people is, Hey, it's, it's your first chance to watch what could be a special year. Um, and, and it's, there's no reason not to come out. That's why I keep telling people, you know, you, you're not having to pay for a ticket. You're not having to pay for parking. You can come watch Memphis football, meet your favorite player and spend zero dollars on it. That sounds fantastic. Josh Moore, we really appreciate your time. Best of luck on Saturday. It sounds like it's going to be an amazing time for everybody involved. We appreciate your time this morning. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. You got it. All right. Another live look from our High Five camera outside the University of Memphis there. It's shaping up to be a gorgeous day once again. We're back in 60 seconds.
All right, Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Let's talk about summer grilling tips. Now that summer is officially here, we want to get out. We want to grill. We want to spice it up here. We know that inflation is creating high prices everywhere you look. So let's talk about grilling and how to do it in an affordable way. I'm joined now by two men who know all about it, will help us through and navigate summer grilling tips. During this grilling season, I have Lamar Moore, celebrity chef, along with Jason Jerome, a senior executive director of supply chain for National Cattlemen Beef Association. Gentlemen, good morning. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? Great, great. Doing well. Thanks so very much. Jason, let's start with you. So let's talk about the food budget, because right now it seems a lot of things on our mind uh, when it comes to grilling out is how we can do it in the most affordable way. How can we do that? Yeah, so thanks for having us, first of all. And what a great question for the first official day of summer. Uh, so what we'll talk about here is, is kind of the way to stretch your dollar. And one of the ways to do that, whether you're buying for a large group or you're just looking for ways to spice things up for your weekday family dinners, you can do something like buy in bulk. For example, this whole strip loin. Well, I know that's a larger upfront investment. You're looking at saving up to $2 per pound by buying in bulk and then cutting that down at home. So if we stick with this strip loin, the average strip loin is about 15 pounds on average. So you're looking at an overall savings of $30 by buying this whole and doing that at home. I'd also say make sure you pay attention to those ads, those kind of circulars that come in your newspaper or your mail or your email. Uh, also, uh, compare costs online. Uh, and don't forget that traditionally, most retailers, grocery stores will offer steaks like strip steaks on sale as we come up to big summer holidays like the 4th of July or Labor Day. And lastly, I'd say do your best to plan meals at home. So you might have strip steaks on Monday, kebabs on Tuesday, and then you could even maybe do a stir fry on a Wednesday. That's a good idea. Always uh, planning out the menu, making sure you don't buy more than you actually need. And then buying in bulk is huge. I mean, that's something uh, that we do at our household. Uh, Chef Lamar, um, let's talk to you now. What are you making for us today? Sure. Um, and, and talking about, you know, the preparation, uh, what I have here is a shrimp filet with a collard green chimichurri. Uh, next is one of my favorites here is a uh, strip loin uh, pan sear with a bourbon peppercorn sauce. And then we've taken the uh, uh, strip down to making a Moroccan spice kebab with a little bit of curry aioli on top. That all looks really good. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a big fan of grilling uh, in the backyard. Um, let's talk uh, for, for a minute here, uh, Chef Lamar, about the best tips for grilling at home. Uh, best, best tips for grilling first is making sure your grill is hot and oil. That keeps the, uh, the beef from sticking to the grill. Um, next would be able to, when you're getting ready to grill, taking your meat out of the cooler, allowing it to rest a little bit. So it's not necessarily room temperature, but it's not ice cold. So that the marbling cooking uh, uh, is great. Um, the, another great tip is when you're going to put your meat on the grill, as you can see, it's really nice grill marks. You're allowing your meat to cook. And, and not move it every 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 so often. So example, um, you allow it to cook for about five minutes. We use a a, a diamond uh, um, a diamond cross cut method. So if you think of a clock, you go from uh, ten to two. So you allow a ten on one side, two on the other side, and then flip over. Um, last but not least is allowing your meat to rest. So meaning that once the meat comes off the grill, you allow it to rest for five to seven minutes. You're allowing the juices to redistribute inside of the meat uh, to keep that great unctuous flavor and and moist and deliciousness. Jason, let me go back to you. Since um, meat and everything seems to be at a premium, what are the best ways when you grill out and perhaps you grill out more uh, than what you eat on that uh, given day, what's your best uh, methods for storing some of that beef? Yeah, so uh, we'll stick with this whole strip loin for now, and let's say we're still buying in bulk. So if you're going to use the beef that day, if you go to the store and buy beef, you're going to use it that day, totally fine to put it in the fridge. Um, but if you're going to cut down something from a whole piece and a bulk, you're probably going to have some portions left over. Uh, and so it's super important on how you store that. So if you're looking at using any of these steaks or whatever you cut out of it in the next one to three days, totally fine to put in your fridge. Anything longer than that, it's very important to put it in the freezer. But packaging is also very important. So whether that be a 
a bag or a container, you want to make it as airtight as possible. If you're using a Ziploc type bag, you want to take as much air out as possible. Uh, and vacuum sealing is the best if you have that, but if not, you can get the air out of that package. Also important to write the date on there so you remember when you put that in the freezer, and that way you just keep your food safe. All great advice, gentlemen. Um, anything else before we let you go? I open this question up to both of you. Any uh, final tips you'd like to mention that perhaps we haven't touched on yet? I'll leave it up to Chef. Um, no, I mean, pretty much everything, every, all the tips that we gave are pretty standard uh, when you're trying to grill and also purchasing uh, your meat and looking for quality products. So I think we're good there. Jason, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that, you know, if you're, if you're looking for um, recipes like this or you're looking for ways to cut down a strip loin or plenty of other cuts, you can go to beefitswhatsfordinner.com to learn more. Okay, appreciate it. Lamar Moore and Jason Jerome, uh, appreciate your time. Happy grilling this summer season. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. How many times do you use your phone? You know, like every week it'll tell you, you used your phone for seven hours or eight hours or more. We use this phone all the time, and that can really cause uh, some problems. Mentally, it can cause some problems physically, too, because you're not going around and doing any kind of physical activity or talking with people. And so now there is this thought of maybe having some tech-free detox zones out there. Let's bring in uh, a frequent guest here to the Action News 5 Digital Desk, Dr. Laura Schultz, Methodist Labonner Healthcare. She's also Senior Director of Behavioral Health. Um, Dr. Schultz, thank you so much for returning on the Digital Desk. Tell us where we are when it comes to our phones and how detrimental it is to our mental health. Good morning. Good morning, thanks for having me. Yeah, you nailed it. I think the average American is spending around seven hours a day looking at screen. And while much of that might be uh, you know, accounted for by our work requirements, staring at the computer, um, we're also on our phones a lot. And that's the place where we could really start to make some difference if we chose to. Our children are spending like over seven hours a day on their screens as well, which if you look at that pre-pandemic, they were averaging around 3.8 hours a day. So they've really seen the greatest increase. And it does have an impact on our physical health, our mental health, our sleep goes down, we're not as active, we're not as engaged with the people around us. So sometimes it can be really good to give ourselves a break in the day from that screen time. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's too much. And, um, you know, I, I know that with my kids, I have kids that are um, in college right now, when they were in high school, we always had to put limits on their phone and their phone use. Um, we just found it they were better at responding to us, uh, interacting with others when we put those limits. Uh, it, it's amazing how much uh, mental health is affected by these phones. So tell me about this idea of like tech-free detox zones. Well, you know, I think it's just good. To, we set limits as parents all the time. Sometimes we're not as good at setting limits on ourselves, but boundaries are helpful and we can set those for ourselves physically and emotionally and we can set them regarding our phones. So one of the ideas is creating areas of your home that are just tech-free, places where you can actually relax and unwind. 
I think many of us during the pandemic started working remotely, at least part time, and that means work follows us home a lot. And everyone thinks we should all be accessible all the time. But what if we had certain areas of our home where we could really just unplug? truly be present with those around us and truly start to get some time relaxing. So that's the idea of creating some boundaries within your home in these specific areas that might just be tech-free, places where you can relax and connect with those around you. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So um, so let's continue on. Let's talk about um, some of the areas of the house where we should be tech-free. comes to mind for me is that kitchen table or dining room table, wherever it is that you are having meals with those around you. Uh, one of the things that we know is when we're on our screens, we're not as mindful or present with the people around us or with what we're doing immediately in front of us. And so what we see is people who are on their screens a lot tend to have a tendency to gain weight, eat less healthy foods. So if you were to put the phones away, the TV off, and just be mindful and fully present of what you're eating, you're going to enjoy the food more. It's going to taste better because you're actually attending to the taste and the texture of the food. You're also going to be more aware of how much you're eating and what you're eating. So mindful eating is something that we do a lot. We recommend that for folks who are trying to lose weight or be healthier. Just be fully present with your food, but also around that kitchen table or that dining room table, connections and community can happen. A lot of times for most of us, if we do have a partner or children in the home or friends gathering, those are our most important people sitting around that table. And so it's an opportunity for us to look them in the eye and engage, recognize those uh, nonverbals that we might miss if we're just texting all day and really connect with those people. So I think both for enjoying the food, for our weight, for our health, and for our emotional and social well-being, the kitchen table is a great place to start. Another place that I really think is wonderful to make a tech-free zone is our bedroom. So the bedroom really, we want it to become a sanctuary. We want that to be a place where we get high quality sleep, and screens are kind of the opposite of what would lead to high quality sleep. The blue lights reduce the melatonin that our brain produces, which is what leads to good quality sleep. Um, and also the content of what we're staring at on our screens can be pretty emotionally stimulating. Uh, we're watching the news, we're engaging with social media, comparison between ourselves and others on social media can lead to that anxiety and feeling sadness and that's never good right before you try to relax and go to bed um, so making sure that bedroom is a place where you can relax and keeping the, the phones and the screens out can be really helpful and then a third area of the home that i think we should really try to create as a tech-free zone is whatever our best outdoor space is so it could be your backyard your front patio if you have some sort of a screened-in porch uh, the green space we know is really good for activating our parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us relax and unwind. But we miss that if we're staring at a screen. Same thing with getting that increased vitamin D and serotonin boost that comes with being outside. We're just, we're kind of stealing our own joy if we're staring at a screen in that relaxing outdoor space. So those three areas of the home for me, would be top places that I would want to keep the phones away. I love it. I, those are great areas where people can start and really kind of um, detox, uh, no question about it. And what's interesting is I would think it, it won't take long for people to immediately see a difference, right? I think so. You know, 57% of us feel like we're addicted to our phones. And we're picking up our phones in 2023, the, the research showed us that the average American is picking up their phone 144 times a day. So I think if you were to start creating some detox zones, there could be an initial kind of increased anxiety of, oh my gosh, where's my phone? What am I missing? But what we'll find is that over time, that anxiety is going to start to come down, and then we can start to realize who we are apart from this digital device. And I do think over not very long, you'll start to experience that sense of relaxation of not having to be responsible to all of the things that come into your phone at any given point 
uh, whether those be work, requirements from families and friends, um, all the social media pressure to check those likes or see who's connecting with you, but to just be present in the world and in the life with the people that we have around us. It's really wonderful, and I, I do recommend people just start trying it and seeing if they start to notice their anxiety come down and their mood go up. Great recommendations, Dr. Laurel Schultz, Methodist Laboner Healthcare Senior Director of Behavioral Health. We appreciate you every time you come on the digital desk. Thanks very much. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. The way people are banking these days is changing. There's a brand new survey that's revealing what consumers want from their banks and how banks can build customer trust and create more positive experiences. Let's, um, let's get some insight on this survey with a banking expert. Uh, Daryl Knopp is joining us now on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. So, uh, Daryl, good morning to you. How is banking changing changing in 2024? Uh, good morning, Andrew. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, no surprise to many of us, just like we've embraced our phones, we've really embraced digital banking and, you know, partly because, hey, it's on that phone. But we've really turned that, that digital banking app, you know, our PC, or more importantly, like I've said, our phone, into the center of our banking universe. And, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think the biggest reason is, is we create a, so much transparency. You can see everything that's going on in the account as opposed to the traditional channels of going into the bricks and mortar or the, the branch network and updating a, you know, the old savings book that we all used to have. So really the switch to digital banking is the primary thing that we've seen. I, I, I totally get that. Uh, certainly today's day and age with the apps and, and, and you know doing online banking, I mean, it's, it's very easy to do. What about this survey? What does it reveal that customers are looking for in a bank these days, Daryl? I think there's a few. I think the biggest thing is that the, they don't want their, you know, they, their time is precious. And so, you know, they want to have a, an app that's very quick and easy to use, easy to kind of create new accounts, um, needs to be intuitive and convenient. And so, you know, one out of four people will drop out of a process that takes 10 minutes or more. And I'm actually surprised that that number is not higher, or at least that it's, that it's not lower from a time perspective. I would probably drop out of a new onboarding app after three minutes, just given just the plethora of choices that people have in, from a digital banking perspective. Agreed. Um, what about um, things that consumers don't like, Daryl? Well, consumers don't like their time wasted. Of course, if they like their time, if, they're, if they want it to be convenient and timely, they want their time to be precious. And so little things like if I'm an existing customer and I'm opening a new product, um, having their time wasted by putting in their address again, you already have their address. You should be doing verification in different ways. And then people want to feel safe, right? We want to have fraud prevention. We want to have uh, make sure that it is safe, that the data is safe, and that when you're asking for information from them, that you're explaining why you're, u why you're asking for that information and how you're going to use it. So, you know, make sure you're not wasting people's time with processes that are too lengthy, as well as it makes sure it's safe. I mean, nothing's more precious than the hard-earned dollars that we all have, and we want to make sure that they're safe and, and well taken care of. No question about it. Um, what about other factors that we found in the survey uh, when it comes to uh, banking customers? And what's making a difference when people bank online? You know, again, I think I would lean in on the safety factors. So um, certainly fraud prevention. But, you know, the big differentiators, and, you know, we often don't see this, but it's, it's just to make sure that the processes are personal, right? It's very easy. One of the things that we're doing is we're replacing 
the friendliness of a branch network with a digital banking app. So addressing little things like, good morning, Daryl, how are you doing, right? You can put that in the app, right? You can, make you can contextualize it around what time of day it is. Um, you know a great deal about me, so utilize that information. Make me feel safe, utilize that information, make it personal. Those are the things that are making the real difference for people staying with their existing bank. You know, trust, convenience, don't waste my time, make sure I can do the things in the app that I need to do. I got it. Um, we have thousands of people that watch us. Anything else you want to mention, uh, Daryl, before we let you go, maybe where we can get more information on this survey? Absolutely. There's a tremendous amount of information at FICO.com, both for you, know, you and I and our personal banking lives and your viewers' lives, as well as for banks or people who work at financial institutions on how they can start to embark upon this transformation that many in the industry are along on the path of. Okay, Daryl Knopp, we appreciate it with FICO. Uh, thanks for joining us on the digital desk. We, we, uh, we appreciate the... Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west, they're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the Mid-South. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots, though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy. Not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. They'll top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight, early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here would be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight. Uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. 
Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chance is possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. That will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some off and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend. Amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before, the, again, the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Every other Monday, we like to talk with our friend Sam Hardeman, City Beat reporter for the Daily Memphian, to talk about what he's working on and certain stories of uh, the past few days. And, and uh, can't help, uh, Sam, good morning to you, but think about um, what happened uh, on Friday morning, early 2 o'clock Friday morning, with, um, with Joseph McKinney, a 26-year-old police officer with MPD. Uh, being involved in a shootout with a suspect, losing his life in the line of duty. Uh, that suspect, the 18-year-old, is also dead, Jalen uh, Lobley, and then um, a 17-year-old and another officer in the hospital, from what I understand still. Um, this morning, so many people have questions, and perhaps you um, have heard those questions as well, about how Lobley um, was able to get out or um, be released on his own recognizance um, one month prior uh, after getting into trouble um, is are you hearing a lot of those questions? Tell me tell me your thoughts on, on a Monday after this happened Friday. It kind of became apparent that this was the thing to talk about, right? Unfortunately, this tragedy that happened in our city on Friday and Friday morning. But yeah, we've heard the same questions, Andrew, and it, it really has been really loud to be quite honest, these questions. And I mean, the police chief, police chief C.J. Davis said it, you know, when she was telling the public of, of Officer McKinney's death, right? Like, Jalen Lobley was out on his own recognizance for, um, you know, steal, being in a stealing stolen car, for having a Glock switch, right? And, and those things are illegal. Those are felonies. And he, you know, under the terms of his release, you know, according to paperwork obtained by the Daily Memphian, he was supposed to have a curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, clearly, you know, he's, he's accused of, of shooting. He's, he's dead now, but he's accused of shooting and killing Officer McKinney. And that clearly happened at a time when he was supposed to be abiding by curfew. And, and the question, you know, I have and that lingers for me is, well, if you're at least on your own recognizance and have a curfew, who's monitoring that curfew? Or is there no monitoring whatsoever? And it's just honor system. Hey, don't don't be out between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Like. That's a real question, and I think readers and, and, and viewers really have that, a fair question to ask. Agreed. Yeah, who's supposed to monitor that? Uh, monitor that? The, other, the other issue, Sam, is, is that um, I saw um, 
State Senator Brent Taylor uh, talk about this even before this incident, uh, that there should be there should be other ways in order to set bond or set bail uh, with some of these offenders out there and perhaps uh, this judicial commissioner and, and taking into account whether they can afford it or, or financial aspects to it. Uh, is this is this going, I mean, it, it feels like something like this would spur a change with that whole formula. Do you see something like that perhaps coming? Oh, absolutely. You know, whether to weigh in on the efficacy of it is not really mine to weigh in on, but certainly I think that this will set the political winds of change a blowing, right? To use that cliche, absolutely. I mean, I think judicial commissioners were already being questioned. You know, their roles were being questioned. I think they faced more scrutiny in the past six, seven months in Memphis, Tennessee than they've faced in my five years here. And I, I would wager that that more scrutiny is coming, right? Because I think our city as a society is really questioning who should be out on bond and for what things should they be out on bond for? And you can see in the documents, um, you know, re regarding jail and lobby, you can see that, you know, MPD for asked for a $150,000 bond. Then there was a, briefly a $10,000 bond given, and then he was released on his own recognizance, right? And, and that got lower and lower and, until there was nothing as time went on. And that, you know, is something that people are going to really question. And, you know, I think as a society, we're going to have also a conversation about, you know, who gets bond. But, but definitely this system that no one really understood a year ago, and maybe most people still don't understand and get, it's definitely in the spotlight and it's going to stay in the spotlight because, you know, one of the people who signed up to protect citizens of Memphis and risk their life for Memphis officer McKinney, he's dead. And, you know, two of his colleagues are wounded and, you know, a 18 year old and a 17 year, 18 year old is dead. And Jalen Lobley and a 17 year old is, is also wounded. Like there was a lot of bloodshed. And, and the question is, is did the bail system set up that bloodshed? The, the name Chris Ingram uh, has, has come up on our reports as the judicial commissioner mm -hmm. yes. who recommended he should be released on his own recognizance. Have we heard anything from him? Has anyone tried to track him down and perhaps get a response? I, I, I know that we've reported his name. I'm not sure if uh, my colleague Aaron Fleming has really been you know carrying the water on this with me playing backup um, has called him yet, but I I would love to hear from him. I think a lot of people would love to hear from him. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, at the same time, these are, these are public officials and, you know, they're in the spotlight, um, you know, not by choice in this case, obviously, but it's, it's definitely, we, we would love to hear. And at, at the same time, we have to keep in mind that this is an anecdotal thing as, as tragic as it is, as many questions as we have, you know, like not to lose perspective here, right? Because there are, probably dozens of people and, and I don't have data in front of me and this is speculation. And so people don't come at me, don't at me on Twitter here, but there are probably dozens of people who are released on their own recognizance who are given similar terms as Jalen and Lobby were, and they probably abide by them. Right. And so as much as the judicial commissioners and the bail system is going to be in the spotlight here, we have a very, very sad anecdotal case. And, and really what we do need to see is, is really hard data on are people who are being released without bail, are they abiding by the terms of their release? Because I think that is something, as much as we want to focus on the public official who let this one young man out, um, we also have to keep that in mind. The other thing, Sam, and, and just plain uh, devil's advocate here, I mean, you have MPD recommending a $150,000 bond. You have another commissioner recommend, or, you know, recommending 10000 You have the DA's office. Uh, recommending against lowering the bond, but yet this one judicial commissioner, Chris Ingram, says no bond, release on his own recognizance. Uh, I, I feel like there are a lot of people that are wondering why would you go against the DA's office, go against MPD, for what? I mean, for what reason, you know? A absolutely a very fair question. And also, you know, given what Jalen Lobley was accused of, right? I would sort of raise the question, and I guess the DA, you know, DA Mulroy did raise this in a statement of like he was, you know, I think labeled, I don't have the correct verbiage in, uh, from the DA statement. I didn't read it again today, I read it Friday, but 
high risk, right? I mean, this is a young man, a, you know, a man, 18 years old, legal adult, who's being, you know, he previously in March, being arrested for being in a stolen car and possession of a Glock switch. Those are, by any definition, high risk behaviors, right? And I think that's what the DA said. They were high risk behaviors. He was labeled as a high risk offender, right? And so, I, like, I think the broader question beyond the judicial commissioner, which is certainly fair, right? And, and raising that question, but also just what happens to, you know, high risk offenders? Like, what is happening in general? Because, you know, Jalen Lobley isn't the first person that's getting caught with a clock switch in a stolen car. Not, not the first, won't be the last. And so, what is happening there? And, and as a society, how do we treat people when they're found and accused credibly of those things? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's sad all around, but certainly uh, there needs to be uh, a really tough discussion uh, that comes out of this, so that our society is uh, less violent. Uh, I would think. Um, anything else you want to uh, you want to talk about with regards to this uh, before we let you go, Sam? No, I mean, obviously there there are multiple families grieving. It's it's tragic, and you know, as much as we talk about this in the news, like it's it's important to remember. You know, and my heart goes out to, you know, Officer McKinney's family and, and you know, Jalen Lobley's family because, you know, both people are, both groups are mourning and it's, it's really sad and, and we got to keep that in mind. But yeah, it's, you know, the city, it, the city has too much of this and I guess I'm editorializing a bit there, but yeah, it just has too much of this and it is very, very sad. Yeah, uh, there's no question. I think, um, I think all of us are in agreement that uh, this has to stop and, it, and it's got to stop in some form or fashion immediately, as soon as possible. Uh, Sam, really appreciate your work. Uh, always appreciate the discussion. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, what else you are reporting for on uh, the Daily Memphian uh, this week and next. We appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Be well. Okay, you too. Thank you so much. Another live look from our High Five camera there outside the University of Memphis where they got the big spring game this weekend on Saturday. We'll be talking about that and your forecast coming up. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I want to talk about a couple things here as we take a live look from our High Five camera there. Midtown Memphis, 52 degrees at 927. Wanted to talk about a few things that, um, that people can get involved in. It's volunteering and um, spreading awareness about a, a number of different topics. Um, and certainly um, stress is something that uh, concerns so many of us uh, throughout the year, not just of certain times of the year, but throughout the year. I'm joined right now by Dr. Vicki Ford. She's Director of Community Engagement with Methodist Lebanon Healthcare to talk more about these two issues. Um, Vicki, good morning to you. So um, I understand Volunteer Week. Um, it, this is a, an emphasis to get people to volunteer. Is that right? And, uh, and tell me about it. Absolutely. Good morning. Thanks for having me on today. Yes, it is. It's Volunteer Month, Volunteer Week, and at Methodist South Hospital, we are combining the, the two themes, I guess, of being Volunteer Month and Stress Awareness Month. And think of ways that our associates can give back to the community and also do some things that are mindfulness, you know, putting some projects together that helps them volunteer because volunteerism, as research has shown, really is beneficial for your mental and your physical health. So we thought it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I could see how those two um, kind of come together. You volunteer 
and it reduces the levels of anxiety or depression or stress and that sort of thing. So it, it kind of works hand in hand. So um, tell me what Methodist is, uh, is doing in, in the coming days and weeks. Absolutely. So we're in day four. It's Thursday. This week is going by so fast. We have done a virtual career day with our adopted school, Havenview Middle School. So we had some of our associates to actually, just like we're doing today, do a Zoom link and join in and talk to students all over the school about their careers. We had someone from our maternity area, a physical therapist, and even one of our, our quality director is actually an engineer by trade. So she had a chance to talk about industrial engineering and what she does. So that was one of the days. We also, because library week is coming up, we had a library card drive. So you don't really think about that, you know, the library sometimes, and if you have a, a card or if it's up to date. So we thought, why not partner up with the Whitehaven branch of the library and have them come and do an outreach right there in our lobby. So they were able to talk to not only our associates, but any visitors or guests that we had that was visiting our hospital. So that was another one of our projects. So lot, lots of stuff going on. <laughs> I, I can tell. I can tell. It's fantastic. It sounds great. And um, I know that we have thousands of people that watch us here on the digital desk each and every morning. If someone's watching and they are kind of raising their hand saying, hey, I want to be a part of this, how can they do that? I tell you what, if they happen to come by Methodist South this week, they can definitely come by. One of the things that we're having today is a volunteer fair. And what that is, we don't hear about that it's very much, but you'll have nonprofit organizations that will come and set up and do a tabling event and talk about volunteer opportunities at their nonprofits. So if anyone wants to come by, that starts today at noon to two. We'll have it on our basement level in meeting rooms A and B. And the community absolutely is invited to come if they would like to hear about what volunteer opportunities are available to them. We've got some great organizations like Alzheimer's Association, Shelby Farms Park will be there, Catholic Charities, MIFA, the Volunteer Memphis, and the YMCA Cato Johnson, Georgia Johnson branch will also be there. So lots of nonprofits. So if you're interested in volunteering, it's a great time to come out and see what opportunities are available through those organizations. And a lot of people always ask me what opportunities can their children be involved in? I know our associates do. So it's a great opportunity to see what maybe your kids can get involved with when they need those service project hours. I, I follow you uh, 100%. So it, through, I know that there's a huge emphasis on volunteering, stress awareness, but what about other times of the year, um, how can people get involved in, in either one? I tell you what, um, Volunteer Memphis is a great resource that uh, we've used before, Volunteer Odyssey as well. Um, when you're trying to find different opportunities to get involved with things in the community, I personally just don't think our communities could be without volunteers. They're so important. A lot of nonprofits cannot manage what they do with the staff that they have. So it's very important for people to really take time out of their schedules, find an organization or a cause that is important to them and give those volunteer hours, call those organizations and see how you can get involved. I think it's extremely important. And we love to stress that in the Methodist healthcare system and here at Methodist South Hospital. I could not agree more with you, Vicki. Absolutely, 100% of volunteering is, is so important. And even with younger folks too, I can remember my kids when they were really young, it was so impressionable um, you know, for them to volunteer and take part. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I could go on and on about it. So uh, appreciate everything that you do at Methodist South. And thanks so much for um, giving us the details on what's happening uh, this week and beyond. Thanks so very much.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west. They're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the Mid-South. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy, not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. that will top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday to early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. That will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some often on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again, the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Do you have seasonal allergies? If you do, you know this time of year is tough. And for some reason, <laughs> this year feels like it's especially bad. Is it? 
or is it not? Is it just our imagination? Let's bring in Dr. Anna Yang. She works at Regional One Health to talk more about the allergy season and perhaps why people are suffering more this year and this season than in years past. Is, is it stronger this year than in years past? Anna, what do you think? Good morning, it's good to be back. Um, thanks for having me. So yes, uh, this season has been particularly bad. Um, we've had a milder winter this year, and so spring started early, and spring started early means all the pollen is out in full swing already. Um, we just got through, you know, COVID flu, RSV season, got past all of that, and now, you know, we're full into allergy season. Right. So um, is there more pollen? I mean, is it because the spring season and our warmer temperatures started earlier? Is that why we feel like we're dealing with a, a, a tougher allergy season? Yeah, that early warmth and start of spring basically triggered all the plants to say, oh, it's time, it's time to bloom and release all the pollens and get, you know, all the process started of, of, of tree and plant and <laughs> weed reproduction. Um, so, yeah, the, the warmth triggered uh, more pollen and earlier pollen. Uh, so this season has, has definitely been worse so far than, than previously. Uh, Memphis in particular, um, yeah. as compared to previous years, fortunately isn't doing so bad compared to the rest of the country. Um, this year we're 26th, I think, on the 2024 allergy capital ranking list, uh, which is better than we've been in the past, but still definitely above average. Yeah, no question. So uh, how, do, how, do they, how do we resolve all this? I mean, what are your best proven methods? Yeah, so... In general, for the most part, um, most of the over-the-counter medications that we have are pretty helpful. The ideal time to start all of this is before uh, the whole allergy season starts. It's a little late for that. Um, so if you have seasonal allergies, this would be the time to go ahead and start those oral antihistamines. If you have specific symptoms, there are nasal sprays. Um, out there, Stero st steroid nasal sprays work just in the nose so you don't get the, you know, whole body side effects that um, taking pill steroids can sometimes bring. Um, there are eye drops out there. There are, um, you can do, you know, nasal rinses. But really, to avoid the trigger is going to be your best bet. So um, if you are somebody who follows the pollen count, if you know what you're allergic to, um, try to avoid those triggers um, on those days, you know, that whatever you're allergic to is particularly high in the air. Um, you know, stay inside, close your windows, try to plan outdoor activities on days, you know, that the pollen count or whatever it is that you're allergic to is, is lower. Um, when you do come inside after being outside, uh, make sure, you know, you, you try to leave your shoes outside, uh, you know, change your clothes, take a shower, um, all that pollen that's now attached to you, you want to take off. Um, and then indoors, make sure you've got good filters set up, uh, make sure you're cleaning and vacuuming on a regular basis. Um, and uh, also, if you are having to be outside, you know, mowing the lawn or whatever, consider wearing a mask too, you know, to filter out some of those particles from, you know, getting inside you. Since it started earlier, is there a chance that maybe allergy season will end earlier? Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed, but pretty unlikely. Um, and, you know, allergies really span the entire spring, summer, fall season, depending on what you're allergic to. Um, so right now, you know, tree pollens are particularly bad. Um, you know, towards the summer months, July, August kind of range, it's more your grasses. Um, and then towards later summer and um, kind of early fall, it's more weed pollen. So depending on what you're allergic to, you may have symptoms, you know, for, for quite some time this, this year. Gotcha. Is there anything else, um, Dr. Yang, you'd like to mention before we let you go about allergy season, the strength of the allergy season this year? Um, anything else? Yeah, so if your allergy symptoms are not being controlled um, with, you know, the kind of measures that we talked about, avoiding your triggers, the over-the-counter things, um, consider seeing an allergist. 
Um, they have specific skin testing that they can do to find out exactly what you're allergic to so that your avoidance measures can be more targeted to exactly you know what you're allergic to. And also they can potentially start you on immunotherapy if that's a good option for you, um, which basically kind of over time teaches your body to try to not to react so much to these allergens that we've got out there. So um, if what you're doing right now isn't working, talk to your doctor. There, there may be some other options for you out there. All right, Dr. Anna Yang, Regional One Health, Emergency Medicine, Family Medicine. We appreciate your time as always joining us on the digital desk. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. All right, another live look from our High Five camera downtown Memphis. It's warming up nicely, 70 degrees, 1006. We're going to be talking about your forecast in 60 seconds. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west, they're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the Mid-South. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy, not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. that will top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight, early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend that will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some off and 
and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here. Mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend. Amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. your News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Have you heard about pickleball? Pickleball is the hottest growing sport in the U.S. In the last three years, let me give you an example, it has gone up some 223%. This is according to Sports and Fitness Industry Association. So there's like nearly 50 million adults playing pickleball all year long. Let's bring in a pickleball pro from the Mid-South. I'm joined right now by Jonathan Goodwin. He's pickleball pro at Lifetime Fitness in Collierville. And full disclosure, I know Jonathan. I'm a member there. Uh, Jonathan, it's good to see you this morning. How's it going out there? Are you, How are the pickleball courts? Uh, oh, it's going real good, Andrew. We actually here right now keeping that, that, that statistics up right now. We got a lot of players with a full court. We got stacked paddles and pickleball is booming right now. So tell We're having me a great a time this about, morning. <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. Tell me a little bit about pickleball for someone that's watching. You know, we have thousands of people that watch us each and every morning, Jonathan. Maybe someone's watching for the very first time. They know it's a little bit like tennis. Um, how would you describe it and why is it so popular right now? Well, honestly, pickleball to me is different than any other, any other sport. I love that, you know, you can have grandparents playing with their grandkids, uh, kids playing with their, with their parents. And it's just one good, fun sport where everybody's involved. It's a good social sport. I actually picked this sport up during COVID time, and I haven't looked back yet. So everybody, you can see in the background, everybody's loving this sport. We all having a great time. It's a good, real good social sport. You know, a, a lot of times people thought that pickleball was, was just for maybe the seniors out there, the older Americans. But every time I pass by that area, Jonathan, there's all kinds of people, young, old, male, female, all kind of demographics. What, what makes it so popular? Well, that's one of the things that I also love about pickleball is it's such a big diversity. Like you just mentioned, we have different races, we have different ages, we have different everything. Um, the thing is about now, kids are picking up in the sport and once a kid has played pickleball his whole life, we're seeing new levels of the sport. But even 78-year-olds, I just lost to some last weekend. That's what I love about the sport is that it's a great diversity sport, and you can have a good time playing with whoever and however. You can meet a lot of good people. So um, give me the rules of it. I mean, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I've never played it. Okay, but I've asked you about it plenty of times. Um, so, so give me uh, give me some basic rules. Well, the basic rules is that you always want to remember is stay out of that kitchen. But it's a whole lot of rules to the sport of uh, pickleball. Um, the number one rule that we really abide by, especially in my clinics here at Lifetime, is to have fun. 
pickleball is a great sport. It's a fun sport. There's a lot of rules and all that. When you first learn, it can make your head stop popping. But the number one rule that we go by is to have fun regardless of what happens. Like, that's the main thing that we get out of this, um, just to have fun. And after that, all the other rules will go behind it. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that, like, pickleball is taking over, you know, the golf course when it comes to business networking and that sort of thing. Um, can, you, can you shed some light into that? Oh, yeah. Pickleball is definitely taking over. If you ask any pickleball place, we're looking at every square inch of Memphis, and we're trying to see the best place that a pickleball court can go in. I played this sport for three months, and I got to looking in my backyard, Andrew, and I was like, I think I can put a pickleball court in my backyard. So now I have a court in my backyard. So pickleball is definitely taking over because the sport is so fun. And like you mentioned, all ages can play, so it's always a great investment to put pickleball there because it brings a lot of fun, lots of social moments and just a great time overall. So it's definitely taking over the whole United States right now. <laughs> so, uh, so, Jonathan, explain to me the, the racket, because, you know, that, that I would think would be the number one piece of equipment you need. How is it different yeah. from, from a, a tennis racket, racquetball, squash, that sort of thing? Yeah, so this is actually one of the more traditional rackets right here. Um, and the difference is, you know, tennis rackets have the big springs and have the big – What's the name? These right here is real comfortable, like you said, for singers and all that, where singers not just holding this big, heavy racket where it hurts their hand or have wrist issues and stuff like that. And it's just a good, comfortable paddle. Uh, table tennis, more of a smaller paddle. So this right here is kind of like a fusion of different sports, of you know, just a different sports of, of uh, playing like paddle ball. So this is the one that we use for pickleball right here. Is that the only piece of equipment that you need? Uh, what would you recommend for somebody who's, you know, wants to start out who, their first lesson or second lesson? What, what would you tell them to bring? Well, so at Lifetime, we teach a whole lot of clinics. And um, when we do our beginner clinics, what we tell them to bring is a paddle. If they don't have a paddle, we let them loan a paddle here at Lifetime Fitness uh, to bring tennis shoes. The you know, you know, most important thing is to have good pickleball shoes because you don't want to come in something that doesn't support your ankle or anything like that. But other than that, pickleball is really not the most expensive sport to get into. It's just really to come with a real positive attitude and have a good time. And mostly that's all you need, Andrew, just to jump into the sport, unless you want to do like what I did and buy a whole pickleball court. <laughs> <laughs> I know you really <laughs> like it. Um, so, so let me ask you this. Um, we've done some stories of – Gauging the popularity of pickleball, we've done stories about all these people getting pickleball injuries, uh, mainly older Americans. What kind of injuries uh, come from pickleball? Well, sometimes with pickleball, I would say um, it's not honestly a real big injury sport, but I would say that the sport that the injuries that come from the sport is mainly could be avoided. A lot of times you're so excited about playing pickleball that you don't take those few minutes to stretch before pickleball and stuff like that. So for me personally, 75 degrees outside, I was playing pickleball and I just jumped right in and I hurt my lower back from just jumping in the sport. But that could have been avoided if I just would have took five to 10 minutes to stretch. So the number one thing I would say is to control the excitement and to take that time to stretch before you play because other than that, it's not really a big injury sport because of the low impact of the sport, say. It's a real good sport to jump in. That's why a lot of singers are in it, because the low impact of the sport. But it can get physical, too, as the better you get. I got you. I got you. So mm -hmm. um, how, does the, how does the scoring work? Is it, is it like tennis? Is it like uh, some other sport? What is it? So the biggest thing with scoring, this is what I teach every class here at Lifetime Also, the best thing to remember when you're playing doubles in pickleball is every game starts off 0-0-2. Zero, zero, so when I say zero zero two, just like basketball, soccer, anything like that, it starts off zero zero. But in pickleball, it starts with the second server. So that's the biggest thing. So once that second server or that team has messed up, then it goes to the next team, and they would say zero zero one. So each server gives an opportunity to serve the ball. Only on the beginning of the game does you know do you start off with server number two. So that's the most confusing thing of pickleball, but once you get that concept, then it kind of goes downhill from there. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Anything else you want to mention, Jonathan, uh, with regards to pickleball? If someone's watching this for the first time, they might want to check it out. Anything else you want to mention about it? Well, just like you know, Andrew, I'm always trying to talk you into pickleball. I'm always telling people to get into pickleball, especially here at Lifetime Gym, because Lifetime Gym, just as you see in the background, if it's a rainy day, it's a cloudy day, we're still here playing pickleball. Um, also have workouts. We have a cafeteria to eat in. We have pool area. We have outdoor pool. So the same thing with pickleball is you will have a great opportunity. Me, my family tried to talk to me into pickleball for the longest. I did not want to take up the sport. But then I finally, they finally caught me up on vacation. And now here I am teaching pickleball. So this is one sport that you would not regret. It's a good time. It's a great way to have good time with your friends and everybody has somebody who's playing this sport right now whether it's your co-worker whether it's your aunt grandparents so it's a good sport to jump in so you can stay in touch with your friends and family also so come nice. on nice andrew we're looking for you too andrew come on down <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah i know i gotta do it i gotta try it jonathan well listen i appreciate your time this morning thanks so very much i know pickleball's the hottest growing sport in the u.s and uh it, you sold it this morning, so uh, we appreciate your time, Jonathan. Thanks so very much. All right, thank you. I'll just get back on the course, okay? <laughs> All right. We'll see you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Walking still remains an ideal exercise, especially for older adults uh, aiming to increase their activity levels. There's so many benefits when it comes to walking. It's very simple and it can do profound things for a person's health. Better sleep, uh, regulated mental health, reduced risk of cardiovascular complications and improved overall quality of life. Let's talk more about this issue with Dr. Jana Robinson, uh, Medical Director of Oak Street Health. Uh, Dr. Robinson, good morning. Thank you for coming on the digital desk. Um, tell me more about why walking is so beneficial to some of the older Americans out there. Good morning. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Walking is a very easy exercise that can be done anywhere and actually has a lot of the benefits for our adult older adult community. Um, we are seeing recent studies that simply walking briskly for 30 minutes a day, four times a week, improves um, mental clarity uh, and actually decreases uh, the risk of developing Alzheimer's. We are seeing that it does a bunch of different things, including reduce stress and help sleep as well. Yeah, so, um, so give me the idea behind the guidelines of 30 minutes a day, four times, each week these guidelines come from a recent study that was published in the journal of alzheimer's disease reports and they took a group of previously sedentary people between the ages of in their 70s and 80s and they were also experiencing some mild cognitive de decline and they had them briskly walk for 30 minutes four times a week in just a few months, they actually saw improvement in their brain function. So that's where some of this recommendation comes from. There's also been several studies um, talking about the 10,000 step day rule, where a recent one show for our older adults, people over the age of 65, getting in somewhere between six and 8,000 steps actually offer the same benefit as a young person or a younger person walking 10,000 steps a day. 
I'm curious about the mental health aspects. We know about the physical aspects of walking. Tell me about the, the cognition and does it matter where you walk? Um, could it be an urban area, a rural area? Is there a difference? Are there more benefits with one or the other? What are you saying? There aren't more benefits one way or another. Of course, being outside in nice weather is always beautiful. You get a little extra vitamin D, but walking in general, regardless of where you walk, does help your not only your physical health, but your mental health as well. Um, there's a little bit of benefit to being outside and walking with other people. You get the socialization and reduce your isolation. Um, walking in the sunshine can help treat and decrease symptoms of seasonal depression, um, which is often associated with being inside in the winter. Um, but walking in general just helps reduce stress and improve sleep quality. Yeah, some places, unfortunately, in Memphis, there, um, you know, there's there's a crime issue, um, and and I guess people can drive and perhaps go to, you know, Shelby Farms Park uh, uh, and some other areas, maybe some parks. Um, what would you recommend for someone who uh, might be a little concerned about, you know, going outside and and walking? Yeah, that's a real problem. That you know, it's a it's a actual problem that we have here in Memphis. Um, our community centers like our YMCA's have wonderful places to walk. Um, Oak Street, our community rooms offer regular exercise um, classes that are open to all the older adults. You don't have to be our patient to participate in those in our community rooms. And um, definitely can we can offer things like walking clubs at Oak Street if there's community interest. So walking with a group of people is definitely uh, can make people feel more safe. If None of those things are options for you. Even simply walking in place or walking in a path around your home will give you benefit. So many uh, different benefits here. Um, what else can we talk about uh, with regards to the benefits of walking? So, again, benefits, they're endless. Um, exercise in general, walking being a wonderful exercise that anybody can do. It doesn't take any equipment with the exception of proper shoes and a bottle of water, um, you can, anybody can do that. You can start slow and work your way up, uh, which is a great way to decrease your stress levels and um, in, improve your health. People who exercise, regardless of their age or conditions, actually live longer than those who don't. Um, so it is, it is a really great thing to add to your repertoire if you aren't doing it. Older adults should take precaution though with our days warming up. That we want older adults are easily more dehydrated, so they want to make sure they hydrate and wear proper fitting shoes and clothing. Okay, uh, Dr. Jana Robinson, we appreciate your time. Uh, Senior Medical Director of Oak Street Health. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on the digital desk. We appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Well, we have a treat for you this morning. We have Tom Wopat joining us on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Many of you know him as Luke Duke from the Dukes of Hazard days. Tom is joining us right now to talk about an upcoming concert tour event that's happening this Friday in Bartlett. Good morning, Tom. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. So for all the fans out there, and you have thousands that are watching right now on the Action News 5 Digital Desk, update us on what's happened over the last few decades since Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> well, let's see. I've gotten divorced a couple of times. Um, uh, on my third marriage, that's a good thing. She's, she's good. She takes care of me. She keeps me in line. And, uh, you know, I... It, it, things have been going great. I, I've done a bunch of Broadway shows in the last 25 years, and um, the last one being a trip to Bountiful in, in 2013. And then I've been making records all along. I, I did a Christmas record with Schneider in 2012, and we actually have the most recent record that I did here. This is this came out in in uh, December of 2022. This is a uh, Tom Wopat, Simple Man. And my I daughter did the cover up. Very proud Excellent. of it. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, congratulations cool. on all your success. I understand that you were nominated for a Tony as well. Tell us about that. Two, two Tonys. Two I was nominated Tonys. Once. 
for uh, Annie Get Your Gun with Bernadette Peters back in the day. That would be like 98 or, or um, 99. And then in 2008, I was nominated for a show called A Catered Affair. Uh, which was a really good show, but we didn't really enjoy that much success on Broadway. But I got some attention. I was actually up for um, up for a Tony Award against uh, Lin Manuel, uh, you know, the, the guy who wrote to Hamilton, and he became a pretty good friend. Uh, I was very impressed with his work. Actually, this record that I just showed you, we include a cut off of Hamilton. We did a song. A song of his that I thought really translated well to what I do. So Dukes of Hazard, I can remember as a young boy watching it, and it still is something you weren't that even, you weren't even thought of yet. <laughs> in, no, in no, 1979. no. 1979. When yeah, were you no. born? Uh, 73. Oh, you were. So you were a little kid then. Little oh, kid cool. watching it. Yeah. You're my, yeah, so you're my age group. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, what what do you think? What would you look at? And you look back to the success of Dukes of Hazard. What would you attribute that success to? Was it the cast? Was it the writing? Was it just all of it? Timing? What? I can tell you it was not the writing. I would say the cast made the writing sound a lot better than it was. And, and no, not to disparage your writers. They had a, an unenviable task in that what they were doing had never been done before. This was a, a Southern action um, series. And th these guys were all guys that wrote for like Dobie Gillis and uh, Gilligan's Island and stuff like that. It was not their, not their strength, but we had a tremendous cast. Uh, the three of us, me, John and Kathy, um, you know, none of us had a, a heck of a lot of experience, but we had a lot of chemistry, especially John and I. And uh, the, the two of us have become the best of friends over the years, and we've kept that going. That's probably my favorite thing out of the whole Duke experience is my friendship with John. Um, but it was a show like, a little bit like, um, like the Andy Griffith show, where you had characters that you really understood. Everybody was clearly de delineated. You knew what each person was. And um, everybody cared about everybody else. And I mean, even we cared about Boss and Roscoe too. We took care of them when they got in trouble. So it was a real um, ensemble show. And we were blessed to have a, a tremendous ensemble. Absolutely, absolutely. So a April 19th, you're gonna be at the Bartlett Performing Arts Center. Um, oh, we're gonna have fun, oh my gosh. T tell me about it, because what can fans expect? You're going to have a meet and greet. You're going to have a concert. Tell me about it. Ah, well, you know, we've been doing these things now for the last 10, 15 years. And uh, what we'll do is we'll have a general leave there in the afternoon in front of the, the concert hall. And a general leave is the car, the car that was on the show. I remember. And what we'll do is we have, you know, we'll have some uh, merchandise that my, my buddy will bring along and uh, so people can get the latest record or the latest DVD. Here's a, oh, another piece of work here. This is uh, from, this is called County Line. It was from the um, the Inspiration Network. I did three movies for them. So that's mostly, a, most of my movie experience in the last 10 years. But we'll, for, we'll be there from two to five, signing autographs, taking pictures. You can get a picture with the car which a lot of people prefer to a picture with me. <laughs> but uh, then that night, um, I'm going to do a thing. I'll do a show. We'll do a concert. And it's with a, a piano player that I know here in New York. And we've worked together several times. He's, he's really terrific. And he covers the range of, of what I do, which is expansive. We do um, things from the American Songbook, you know, um, old time standards. We do original material that I've written. Um, some of it's pretty good, I got to admit. And then we do covers of, of other people like James Taylor or Sean Colvin or say the Hamilton thing. Um, 
and it's it's an entertainment. It's it's the the music is good. The performance is usually as good as the music, and uh, we generally have a great time. And uh, that'll be in the evening. But the afternoon is the meet and greet, and anybody who wants to come by and just say hi, be I'd love to see them. And uh, the car is something you, that you shouldn't miss. Uh, there are very few '69 uh, Dodges that are that don't that aren't paint, painted orange in this day and age. <laughs> You're right. Have you ever been to Memphis before? If so, where did you go? When oh, was yeah. it? No, no. I, listen, I'm I'm so excited to get back to Gus's chicken. I'm just saying. Gus's fried chicken is on my top ten all-time list as far as as uh, food goes. Fantastic, yeah, that that top ten for sure for me as well. Um, anything else you want to let the fans know? Uh, this has been great, Tom. I, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes. Anything else? Hey, I I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk to an old timer like me. But we will have fun. And I just want to assure everybody that shows up, we spend time with everybody, we chat with everybody, and uh, it's something I enjoy to do. What the heck? Who knew that 45 years later we'd still be talking about this show? <laughs> I it's know it. To, I know it. It's going to exist long after I'm gone, but as long as I'm here, I'm going to enjoy it. You should. You should. Tom Opat, we really appreciate you joining us on the digital desk. And congratulations on all of your success. And we look forward to seeing you April 19th. You better come by, the, Buster. You, you I would love come. to. All right. You better. I would love to. I would love to. At the Bartlett Performing Arts Center. Tom, thanks. Appreciate that. All right. Let's... Get another live look from our High Five camera. Gorgeous weather here on a Monday. 73 degrees at 1036. We're back with your forecast in three seconds. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday to kick off your new work and school week. It's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course What's of the up? day. With temperatures that will warm Scotty up into the Scheffler. lower, even some mid-80s. That's a normal possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west. They're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the Mid-South. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again. You'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots, though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy. Not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs. that will top out generally in the lower 80s tonight. A couple showers moving across the area overnight early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. 
Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. That will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some off and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend. Amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Have you often wondered, especially this time of season, is it allergies or am I really sick? You know, allergies get worse as we age, and sometimes it's really difficult to really kind of differentiate between the two. Let's bring in someone to really kind of help us in this question and answer some questions. I'm joined now by Dr. Kendra Shepard. Uh, an MD with Dedicated Care Senior Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Shepard, thanks for joining us. Uh, where, where do we begin on that? Because I know a lot of people, especially here in the Memphis area, a lot of people suffer from seasonal allergies. How do we determine really quickly if it's allergies or if it's a sickness? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me again. And yes, um, allergies, we call it allergic rhinitis and hay fever. It's so common. One in four um, adults and one in five children have allergies. And the way we usually tell, you know, the normal symptoms are that runny nose, the itchy eyes, itchy ears, that post nasal drip where you're going <clears throat> in the back of your throat. Those are all common with allergies. However, if it's sickness, such as a virus, most of the time you'll have a fever or very sore throat as opposed to a scratchy throat. And those are the times where you want to sort of contact your doctor to see if you need to be screened for viruses like flu or COVID. Gotcha. And, you know, as I mentioned off the top, Dr. Shepard, um, you know, as we age, uh, allergies get more severe. I didn't know that. Can you tell us um, a little bit about some of the reasons behind that? Yeah, and, and aging is a process. And so all of us, when we age, our cells age, even our immune system, immune system ages. So as we get older, the allergies tend to get worse because we, our immune system is not working as well as it did um, in our younger years. And so we, with the season lasting longer, um, we just want to be able to do as much preventing, making sure they avoid the triggers, making sure they stay out of the pollen um, to prevent um, the allergies or at least reduce the allergies so that they won't get sicker. Yeah, I, you know, in Memphis and, and the Mid-South, I mean, we, we have the tree pollen, uh, grass yes. pollen, uh, and it just makes people go crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there ways, um, let's, let's, let's hear some of the ways, the best ways, preventative methods to really kind of at yeah. least maybe not stop allergies altogether, but at least kind of reduce some right. of those symptoms. Yes. So, of course, we want to avoid the pollen, right? We can't avoid it when we go outside. It's covering our car, you know, and it's outside. But once we come back in, what we want to do is take our clothes off, uh, remove our shoes, shower at night, sort of shower before you go into the bedroom. You don't want it in your um 
in your bedroom. Um, when you are out, it's optional, but you can wear a mask to reduce the risk and goggle-like glasses to kind of keep it out of your eyes. Those are ways to avoid the pollen. It's inconvenient because we get a little hot and sticky, you know, um, and so you want to do that. And then um, another step for people who have really kind of moderate to severe allergies, Saline nasal sprays, sprays are really good. So rinsing out your nose with a, a saline solution and sort of getting all that gunk out preventively um, before you use your over-the-counter allergy medicines really, really helps uh, in um, preventing or at least decreasing um, our reactions to allergies. These are some great tips, easy to understand and easy to uh, to implement today. Um, anything else before yeah. we let you go, um, Dr. Shepard, that we can touch on you feel is important about this? Well, I, I want to touch on, I want to make sure that people are talking to their doctor about allergies, going to a trusted source. Here at Dedicated, we ask people to come in all the time. And I say that because we want to make sure it's allergies and not a virus, you know, and sometimes people can't tell. And so we commonly test for flu and COVID regularly. And we do that because we have medicine for it, right? And so uh, sometimes when you're like, okay, well, it's allergies, or you're someone who doesn't normally get triggered by pollen, that's a time to come in and say, hey, I just want to make sure uh, you know, everything is going okay. So make sure you have a doctor you trust, come on in, get tested, flu or COVID, get that reassurance, um, and also get those medicines to help mitigate um, that allergic rhinitis or those signs of allergies. All right, Dr. Kendra Shepard, we appreciate your time this Thank morning. You. Great conversation, and I know it helped yes. uh, a number of different people out there. Thanks very much. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I want to talk about a couple things here as we take a live look from our High Five camera there. Midtown Memphis, 52 degrees at 927. Wanted to talk about a few things that, um, that people can get involved in. It's volunteering and um, spreading awareness about a, a number of different topics. Um, and certainly um, stress is something that uh, concerns so many of us uh, throughout the year, not just of certain times of the year, but throughout the year. I'm joined right now by Dr. Vicki Ford. She's Director of Community Engagement with Methodist Lebanon Healthcare to talk more about these two issues. Um, Vicki, good morning to you. So um, I understand Volunteer Week. Um, it, this is a, an emphasis to get people to volunteer. Is that right? And, uh, and tell me about it. Absolutely. Good morning. Thanks for having me on today. Yes, it is. It's Volunteer Month, Volunteer Week, and at Methodist South Hospital, we are combining the, the two themes, I guess, of being Volunteer Month and Stress Awareness Month. And think of ways that our associates can give back to the community and also do some things that are mindfulness, you know, putting some projects together that helps them volunteer because volunteerism, as research has shown, really is beneficial for your mental and your physical health. So we thought it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I can see how those two um, kind of come together. You volunteer and it reduces the levels of anxiety or depression or stress and that sort of thing. So it, it kind of works hand in hand. So um, tell me what Methodist is, uh, is doing in, in the coming days and weeks. Absolutely. So we're in day four. It's Thursday. This week is going by so fast. We have done a virtual career day with our adopted school, Havenview Middle School. So we had some of our associates to actually, just like we're doing today, do a Zoom link and join in and talk to students all over the school about their careers. We had someone from our maternity area, a physical therapist, and even one of our, our quality director is actually an engineer by trade. So she had a chance to talk about industrial engineering and what she does. So that was one of the days. We also, because library week is coming up, we had a library card drive. So you don't really think about that, you know, the library sometimes, and if you have a, a card or if it's up to date. So we thought, why not partner up with the Whitehaven branch of the library and have them come and do an outreach right there in our lobby. So they were able to talk to not only our associates, but any visitors or guests that we had that was visiting our hospital. So that was another one of our projects. So lot, lots of stuff going on. 
I, I can tell. I can tell. It's fantastic. It sounds great. And um, I know that we have thousands of people that watch us here on the digital desk each and every morning. If someone's watching and they are kind of raising their hand saying, hey, I want to be a part of this, how can they do that? I tell you what, if they happen to come by Methodist South this week, they can definitely come by. One of the things that we're having today is a volunteer fair. And what that is, we don't hear about that it's very much, but you'll have nonprofit organizations that will come and set up and do a tabling event and talk about volunteer opportunities at their nonprofits. So if anyone wants to come by, that starts today at noon to two. We'll have it on our basement level in meeting rooms A and B. And the community absolutely is invited to come if they would like to hear about what volunteer opportunities are available to them. We've got some great organizations like Alzheimer's Association, Shelby Farms Park will be there, Catholic Charities, MIFA, the Volunteer Memphis, and the YMCA Cato Johnson, Georgia Johnson branch will also be there. So lots of nonprofits. So if you're interested in volunteering, it's a great time to come out and see what opportunities are available through those organizations. And a lot of people always ask me what opportunities can their children be involved in? I know our associates do. So it's a great opportunity to see what maybe your kids can get involved with when they need those service project hours. I, I follow you uh, 100%. So it, through, I know that there's a huge emphasis on volunteering, stress awareness, but what about other times of the year? Um, how can people get involved in, in either one? I tell you what, um, Volunteer Memphis is a great resource that uh, we've used before, Volunteer Odyssey as well. Um, when you're trying to find different opportunities to get involved with things in the community, I personally just don't think our communities could be without volunteers. They're so important. A lot of nonprofits cannot manage what they do with the staff that they have. So it's very important for people to really take time out of their schedules find an organization or a cause that is important to them and give those volunteer hours, call those organizations and see how you can get involved. I think it's extremely important. And we love to stress that in the Methodist healthcare system and here at Methodist South Hospital. I could not agree more with you, Vicki. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, volunteering is, is so important. And even with younger folks too, I can remember my kids when they were really young, it was so impressionable um, you know, for them to volunteer and take part. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I could go on and on about it. So uh, appreciate everything that you do at Methodist South. And thanks so much for um, giving us the details on what's happening uh, this week and beyond. Thanks so very much. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk here on a Monday. To kick off your new work and school week, it's not looking half bad, my friends. Lots of sunshine expected today, at least to start off. We'll start to see a few more clouds building in through the course of the day with temperatures that will warm up into the lower, even some mid 80s, not out of the realm of possibility as we go through the course of the day. You see the clouds out to the west, they're building in. That's going to be part of the story here today. Those clouds will eventually help to bring in some more moisture as well, or at least an indicator that more moisture is starting to build into the area and I think by this afternoon you're definitely going to notice that the mugginess has come up as well. There is a risk for some storms to make their way across parts of the mid south. I think late Tuesday into Wednesday. This is not going to be an all day situation. Actually, most of the day Tuesday and most of the day on Wednesday will not feature anything really going on, but there will be some opportunities for some storms to contend with here and there. So what to expect as we go through the course of the next couple of days? It's warm and a bit breezy here on this Monday. A few storms I'd say widely scattered showers and thunderstorms late Tuesday into early Wednesday. A couple more chances for rain and then we get cooler heading towards the upcoming weekend. So let's go hour by hour with our first alert future cast and what you'll notice here again, you'll just see those high and mid level clouds kind of thickening up a little bit through the course of the afternoon, especially across portions of East Central Arkansas down into Northwest Mississippi. Most spots though, it'll be kind of partly cloudy, not a bad looking way to get through your Monday with highs that will top out generally in the lower 80s. Tonight, a couple showers moving across the area overnight, early tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be much of a problem, should be in and out of here fairly quickly. Tuesday morning, we should start off with clouds, some sun peaks here and there. I think we end up with more sun breaks through the afternoon hours with chances for scattered showers to develop 
as we get closer to the late afternoon hours as the frontal boundary gets a little bit closer to us. This is going to be around the same time that the cap is beginning to erode. So when that happens, we're going to see a few thunderstorms get a little bit more active, especially as we get closer to dinner time. There could be one or two stronger storms that uh, trails across uh, portions of northeastern Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Hill, northwest Tennessee, and the west southwestern Kentucky. Needless to say, this area right here will be the highlight point to watch for the potential for a few stronger storms overnight uh, Tuesday into early Wednesday as the front works its way down towards the south. Still some uh, isolated showers possible early Wednesday morning. Then the front works its way farther south, stalls out to the south of us, and here comes some warmer temperatures moving in here. We'll rebound nicely well into the 80s, not just on your Wednesday, but also uh, into your Thursday as well. Another uptick in rain and storm chances possible again as we head towards Wednesday night into early Thursday as the front again works its way farther down to the south. Here comes the cooler air as we move into the upcoming weekend. That will bring us more chances for rain and storms during that time frame as well. I think just more so rain, but needless to say, there's going to be some off and on opportunities for rain and storms to contend with as we go through the next couple of days. One chance here, one chance here, one chance here, mostly overnight shower and storm opportunities. I think we're more front facing opportunities for rain as we head towards the upcoming weekend. Amid the cooler temperatures, lower to middle 60s expected this weekend from our highs in the 80s and maybe even middle 80s as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So something to be cognizant of. It's going to be quite toasty, quite muggy as well as we go through that time frame. Of course, some drier air trying to punch in here behind that first system. We get another opportunity for rain heading into uh, early Friday, uh, late Thursday night into Friday before the, again the more front facing opportunities for rain come in during the daytime of Saturday and Sunday amid the cooler air. All right, that does it for us here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Have yourself a wonderful afternoon. We got Ariana Poindexter standing by for Action News 5 Midday. She's going to take you through the next hour with all the news and weather that you need for the rest of the day. It is an amazing day. If you take a live look from our High 5 camera outside the University of Memphis, 73 degrees, 1056 is the time. By the way, they have their spring game on Saturday at Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium. Uh, that's going to be a fun day and fun for the whole family. That starts at 3 o'clock. There's another live look from our High Five camera. Downtown Memphis, again, beautiful temperatures out there. Make sure you join us once again tomorrow morning for another edition of the Action News 5 Digital Desk. We go from 7 to 11 each and every weekday morning. You can find us on all of our digital platforms and digital channel 5.3, also channel 907 on Xfinity. We'll see you later. Did you win your uh, family pool? The racket? No, it came last time. No. It doesn't matter. Um. Social media. Where does the where does the girlfriend or wife work? This is the address I found. I don't know how accurate it is. Mumford. Right, that's he went to Mumford High School. Um, I know. Yeah.
I know. I know. I know. Some days are better than others. It, it's Friday. Though. It's Friday. <laughs> What's going on, Pierre? Hey, how you doing? Good. You all right? Good to see you. Good, to see you. Good man. Just sweating a little bit down here. You know. Oh, we can also be grateful for those I know. We got with it, man. I, that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know.
Hey, Jack. 